Hello, good morning. I'm your host, Jason Adai, and would like to welcome you to the webinar on hacking of healthcare institutions. We'll be starting in the next five minutes. Um, I will advise that we all stay tuned and we'll be back. Thank you very much.
Hello, good morning. Hello once again and good morning. Again, I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar on hacking of healthcare institutions. Um, firstly, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Samkwashi, Head of Ghana Health Service, uh, followed by the second speaker, Mr. Ash, Head of Cybersecurity, Quantum Security Solutions. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, for those who are joining for the first time, uh, I want to wish you a happy uh, new year. Uh, thank you for taking time of your busy schedules to participate in this um, webinar. Um, I am very passionate about health care, uh, cyber security, and I think that these webinar is going to be awesome. Uh, we have two fantastic and great speakers, uh, myself and uh, Mr. Ash. Mr. Ash is an accomplished uh, cybersecurity expert, and we believe that the next two hours we would be able to take a deep dive into how healthcare institutions are vulnerable when it comes to um, the use of uh, technology, what can be done about it to ensure that your patient-centric uh, systems are safe and there are no patient safety uh, concerns, the healthcare uh, delivery at your various uh, uh, locations. So once again, uh, welcome to the webinar. I'll be handling two segments, why healthcare institutions are easy targets and the legal ramifications of unauthorized intrusions or access to healthcare institutions, health IT infrastructure, and then the next speaker will deal with uh, some um, demo, will provide some demo on, on what hackers do as well as uh, what to do to position your organization to address uh, unauthorized access. So my presentation would follow out, I want to share an overview of what hacking is, the types of hackers, the top 10 vectors uh, that hackers use, some statistics on hacking in the healthcare ecosystem, an overview of the Ghana or typical healthcare ecosystem, why healthcare is an easy target, and then the legal and ramifications, legal ramifications of hacking healthcare uh, systems. So, Typically, when we talk about uh, hacking, we, we mean gaining unauthorized access to data in a computer system. So um, digital uh, X-ray equipment, MRIs, uh, digital laboratory uh, equipments, the hospital information uh, management system. Any, any IT infrastructure or device or medical diagnostic devices that you use in the delivery of care uh, is susceptible to some unauthorized access. And one that is done successfully is referred to hacking. Now, who is a hacker? A hacker is, is simply a person who has high competences in IT, information technology, and information uh, security tools. That person uses his or her skill sets and the tools that he's aware of to undertake either legal or illegal uh, activities. There are various types of, uh, of hackers, okay, so, uh, and they are motivated in a certain way to, you know, undertake their activities. So there's a black hacker uh, who, who is a criminal, and they hack into people's system for profit. So they make money from hacking, they enjoy it, it's fun. Then there's an the ethical hacker, this, this group of hackers, and I take legal and ethical um, activities 
and their role most of the time is to uh, prevent or uh, uh, support businesses and strengthen their IT uh, infrastructure. Then the, the gray hacker who undertakes uh, hacking uh, for a fan, that is his or her uh, uh, motivation. Then there's the script uh, kiddies. These are amateur hackers who hack uh, for, uh, to just create disruption. For instance, if a, a virus or a malware is released, these group of people, are, they are kind of inexperienced. They are not highly skilled. They can temper or temper with the source codes of those uh, malware and then create more chaos. Uh, literally, I can say, I like to describe them as uh, adding more salt to a pot of soup or stew to make it worse. When you're already complaining that the, the stew is salty, they kind of add more uh, uh, salt to it and create confusion for everybody. The green hacker is a, a hacker who is in training, he's learning, he's learning how to become a hacker, he's undertaking courses and to become a, a hacker. Then there's the blue hat hacker, are also those professionals who kind of review software uh, that are developed by vendors with a view of identifying bugs and other errors in the software uh, before it is distributed for use either in private or, or in public. And that's the blue hacker. The red hat, hat hacker are also those group of highly skilled cybersecurity professionals whom government kind of high to ensure that the critical information infrastructure of the, of the nation is also uh, protected. Then there's also the state or, or nation-sponsored hackers. If you recall, uh, several years ago, there was the U.S. was accusing Russia and other countries of having instigated or organized a hacking into their electoral electoral systems. There's a malicious hacker who is a this this granted employee in the organization who now decides to use his his skill sets and competencies to expose. The organization, if the organization is engaged in some unethical uh, activities, then of course there's the hacktivists. There's a, the activists are, are also hackers who can take their activities for political reasons. If you recall, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this popular uh, guy called uh, Snowmed, and uh, Snowmed uh, became a whistleblower when he exposed some activities which he believed was not proper uh, in the in the US and had to be uh, extradited or resettled in other countries. So what do hackers do? Hackers typically undertake two mainstream of activities. The first group of activity is called the ethical hacking. And then there's also that an ethical hacking. And before I undertook a course in, in cybersecurity, I have a, I had a very different uh, perspective of, of what hacking uh, was about. Okay, I used to think that uh, I used to think that uh, hackers were very uh, dangerous people, were very bad people. The the all they did was to uh, uh, cause confusion and and, and chaos uh, to the organization, and also you know. Create chaos. Okay, so I'll show you my view of who uh, a hacker was before I started uh, the hacking uh, course. Okay, so okay, so if you can see me now, this was my perception of a hacker. Okay, so you don't you don't see my face, my voice is muffled, and I'm a very dangerous person. OK, so this is a hacker and people are scared of you. Your voice is muffled <laughs> like a robot. OK, but then uh, things have changed and hacking is a full time. Profession, you take a course called certified ethical hacking. So that mindset or pers perspective that people had that a hacker is a very dangerous person and you don't want to go near him. It's not entirely true. Um, most organizations who have big data um, 
have have engaged the services of hackers because then you need to have the mindset, know the mindset of a hacker before you can build a robust or a resilient infrastructure to prevent them from causing uh, havoc uh, to your infrastructure. So ethical hackers undertake authorized, they undertake, and I insist that it's emphasize that it is authorized breaking into a computer systems to gain unauthorized access to data, computer systems and application. So they are employed and paid huge sums of money to try and see if they can gain unauthorized access uh, to the company's uh, network infrastructure, data or whatever mission critical uh, application that is being run. Okay, so they focus on evaluating the security of the IT systems with a view of identifying vulnerabilities in the ecosystem and then help the institutions build a more resilient and robust uh, IT system of, and, and infrastructure. And this is lawful. You take a course called Certified Ethical Hacker. You take certification and courses to attest to your competences in the field of cybersecurity and, and, and you make money uh, out of it. Then there are the other bad guys, the black hats who are who undertake unethical activities. They don't seek your permission. They, they don't seek your authorization. They break into your uh, computer systems and their main objective or motivation is to steal your data and to change the data that they have in your system or even to destroy data and information. And this is unlawful. So you need the ethical, the ethical hacker to try and review or assess your, um, your IT systems, infrastructure to prevent the, an article hackers from operating in your uh, ecosystem. OK, so I uh, move on to my next uh, slide, which also uh, seeks to, which seeks to uh, provide some analytics on hacking. Now, worldwide, hacking in the healthcare industry is on the Ascendancy. If you, this is an, an, an analytics I picked from the HIPAA Journal in 2019. And you can see from the line graph that from 2009 to 2018, hacking of healthcare institutions has been on the uh, ascendancy. And, and why it is so is one of the objectives of this uh, webinar. Okay. Not only that also, but then it's lucrative and profitable to hack healthcare institutions, hospitals, uh, uh, digital diagnostics uh, uh, centers, because you get premium price for data from healthcare. When, when we also look at this statistics, which is also from IBM, it shows that when you hack healthcare institutions, you get premium price for the data. And then it also costs healthcare institutions the most you know, high, the most money to fix whatever problem you have. So whichever way you look at it, the healthcare industry is at risk when it comes to the activities. Um, we also are very particular about hacking in the healthcare industry because it has major patient safety uh, concerns. Um, patient safety, not only in terms of uh, COVID-19 viruses, but then your whole uh, medical digital diagnostic equipment can go offline. Your electronic health information management system can also go offline. You cannot deliver care to patients. You cannot process your claims. There are a lot of things you cannot do, and it has major uh, life and death uh, scenarios as far as, far as the patients uh, are concerned. So uh, healthcare also features prominently when it comes to data breach and the cost. Then also, when you look at the data that is breached and the, the area that provides the highest, highest uh, what do you call it, um, attraction is your date of birth as per this analytics. So the, your date of birth and uh, social security number attract the highest uh, attention, which is 21.6%. Now, following your date of birth, you also, hackers are interested in your name and your physical uh, address. Then the focus now moves on your uh, to your personal health information, which is 18.4%. Then also 
you move on to other information, then your banking and uh, your email and also your username and, and password. So the reason why hackers are having a full day in the healthcare industry is because our data is very rich and it also has high premium, uh, what you call it, prices, if you have to sell it on the black market. Now, in the year 2020, this is also coming from the HIPAA general. Uh, HIPAA is one of the authoritative or authorities when it comes to healthcare analytics uh, in, the, in the US, and they do worldwide analysis. Now, HIPAA and I took a research and found out out of the data breaches that occurs in the healthcare industry, the major source or route used is your email. Of course, the, the, the desktop, the also electronic uh, medical records, the also network server, there's the other, and then the paper and phone. But the email is, is the most attractive uh, route that is used uh, for unauthorized access uh, to. So it stands to reason that um, corporate institutions must pay serious attention to what system they put in place to prevent compromised email and uh, systems. Okay. So to take a deep dive into it, I want us to just take some time and, and check um, these sites. Okay, I, I have identified these four sites. And the first one, uh, have I been pwned, is a site that you use to check if your email has been compromised. Because as a cybersecurity professional, you must know whether you are vulnerable or not. And that is also one of the routes that hackers you. So if you can go online and check, I'm going to do that. Uh, have I been pwned? OK, so I'm opening the link. So it brings you to this link. You see the white box over there. And then I'm typing an email of a staff of the corporate organization. So estafin at gmail.com. So now, as a cybersecurity professional, what I want to do is I want to go through the emails of top management routinely to find out which of them have emails that are compromised. Because if your email account is compromised, it is cool job for any hacker, any hacker when they are undertaking their reconnaissance uh, activities to identify a gate or route to uh, gain more information or access to it. So if I click on the pun, okay it would scan through the database and then gives me some feedback. So the feedback you get is, is good news. Um, no opponent has been found out. Uh, and find out if your email has been compromised. And, and then I'll, I'll, as I proceed, show you what to do if your email uh, account has been uh, compromised. The second link is www.hotsheet.com in which to this link also I'm clicking on it. What it does is it tells you that your email has been compromised, but then it also gives you an indication of the source and the causes of that uh, uh, compromise. So I'm using the email um, I used earlier on at gmail.com. Okay, so you see the feedback which says no breaches found. Okay, I'm going to use an email which I know has been compromised. This email, zibay at hotmail.com. I want to find out. So, assuming this is the email of your boss, so you come to this site, you run it, and the feedback I'm getting is that the email has been compromised. So, you see that it says breach detected. Okay, so these are the kind of things hackers do. So, they are very excited when your systems are distributed, uh, email. Is, 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 is breached, your director general's email is breached, your head of finance email is breached. 
then they figure out exactly what to do. Now you get additional information from these breach emails. Okay, it tells me the summary of breach data found. Uh, it also uh, tells me an identity, alleged the names, the password things, uh, passwords, usernames. It gives, it gives me a lot more uh, information. And then on a rating also tells me that my exposure level is for uh, over 10. Okay, so these are some of the things that or steps that um, hackers who want to gain unauthorized access to your systems do. And as a cybersecurity professional, and I'm laying emphasis on cybersecurity professional because IT is not the same as cybersecurity. They are two different scopes, job description and functions that, that they perform. But in the event that you don't have a cybersecurity professional in your organization, we can still learn these tools and, 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 and tricks, and then also try and see how you can secure your, your organization's uh, IT uh, infrastructure. Then I also go to the next uh, link, which is password, which is the password monster. What a password monster does is it also checks the strength and complexity of your password. And, and it tells you whether your password is weak, whether your password is strong, because to keep hackers away from your institutions and your IT infrastructure, your locking credentials might be strong, and very complex, and that is what they do. So for this one, I'm also going to type my password that I use. So as you continue typing your password, it tells you, it gives you feedback on it. So this is my personal password and the feedback I'm getting it is very strong. It's a very strong password and you require a million years to uh, crack the, this password. Okay, so uh, you have to do this uh, regularly as a systems uh, administrator or network administrator or database administrator to ensure that um, you don't you don't make yourself vulnerable when it comes to um, having access to your your systems. Then the final is my uh, favorite, which is the data where uh, recovery. Sometimes, you know, people uh, think they are IT, they are very uh, savvy, uh, especially um, those who have some training, they've done some courses online, and that uh, empowers them to install uh, routers and, and, and switches. But for all those devices that come with default passwords, okay, um, I want you to understand today, there is a site that contains all your default password online. So if you're a hacker and you undertake your scanning of an organization's uh, ecosystem and identify the devices that they are using, the first thing you do is to go to this site, which I'm going now. And when I get to the site, the site provides me with a list of all networking equipment, uh, devices that uh, require uh, username and passwords and, 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 and is available. So for instance, the, on the screen, you will see on the first left, the manufacturer of the equipment, the model name, the revision, the protocol, and then the username and the password. These are default passwords. So it is never cool to think you are IT, you go to the market, you buy a switch or a router or an access point, you connect it and, and, and think you are secure. You are never secure. All I need to do is to scan your ecosystem, identify the manufacturer of the devices you are using. And once I get the, those details and, and I, I come to this site, I get a default username and password and bingo, I'm inside your network infrastructure. And that's it. And this is also cool, uh, cool job. You, you don't need to work very hard. You make the work easy for anybody who knows um, what to do to access your network infrastructure. So you must know all these little uh, ways or routes that uh, these hackers use to access your system. Now, 
when your there is a data breach, you must also uh, I need you to understand that the breach ecosystem what it does is that the hackers move your data. Your data is moved from one location to another location. In the event that your email account is compromised, the details of your email account is harvested. That is the IT terminology used. It's, it's harvested. So they harvest your email account and send it to a place called the dark web. The www that we all use to browse the World Wide Web, to browse on the internet, is made up of three categories. So there is the surface web. Okay, so the surface web, the surface web, if you can see it, constitute only 4%. So if you are happy to be browsing, um, checking your emails, um, going to CNN, yeah, checking your uh, Facebook, uh, going to other sites, using other Internet Explorer, um, um, uh, what's the other one? Internet of Explorer, Firefox, Opera, and other browsers. You are using only 4% of the capacity of the WWW, World Wide Web. The others are hidden, and you must know how to access those hidden sites, and I'm sure the next uh, presenter will speak about, about, about it, because then you, you, you must know that when your data is breached and compromised and harvested, it is sent to the dark web, and the dark web is a lucrative black market where all manner of things are sold over there. You can buy credit cards, you can buy passwords, uh, pin codes, you can, you can buy an, a weapon, you can do all sorts of uh, unauthorized and illegal things at the world, uh, at the dark web, but you must know how to access it. And it's a dangerous place to go if for the uninitiated. You must declare in your mind why you are going there because you end up also getting into trouble if you don't know what to do to protect yourself when you are accessing the dark web. Okay, so what do you do when you find out that the links I showed you um, indicate that your password has been breached? or it's been compromised, your email account has been compromised. The first thing you need to do is to create a complex and strong password. So what do I mean by a strong and complex password? A strong and complex password uh, contains of four broad uh, characters or categories. First, your password must contain a number from one to 10. Second, your password must contain an uppercase letter, that is a capital letter. They must also contain a lowercase alphabet. There must be a special character, either a question mark or an exclamation mark, and must be a minimum of at least eight characters in all. A combination of the four broad categories must be eight in total. You must make it a habit to change your passwords every 90 days. So you have to figure out how to do it. Do not, under any circumstances, use personal information or dictionary uh, words as a password because it's very easy to crack. When I did test my password, it told you, you saw it, that it would take over a million uh, years to crack it because it was very sophisticated and complex. So you want to be using sophisticated and complex password. You don't want to be using a password like happy, uh, February, uh, January, uh, anointing, and, and republic. You, you know, yes, yes, Jesus Christ. You don't want to be doing those things. Okay, you don't you don't want to do that. Or the the names of your wife or your uh, children. You don't want to do that. You stay focused on the broad uh, four categories. And I repeat, which is the number, the alphabet, which is a capital letter, the uh, lowercase, and the alphabet category a special character, and a minimum of eight characters. So if your password does not comply with this, make sure you change it after the presentations and make it strong. You are not supposed to share your passwords with anyone. I recall a couple of years ago, I was undertaking an activity in one of our healthcare institutions, and I realized that they've been keeping their passwords under their keyboard. Some of it, some people also write it boldly and stick it on the monitor, they put a cell tape on it and paste it. And then they tell you that oh, they have a poor memory and they want to make sure and they can easily recollect the passwords. Um, so 
use a password that you can easily recollect and not uh, forget. Okay. Then also make sure you use genu antivirus uh, systems applications and that antivirus application must also be uh, updated. I found myself in situations where I have to debate people on antiviruses. They have told me they don't believe in antivirus. Antivirus must be for free and they can go online. You know when you go online, you can get AVG. And I remember a hospital, uh, somebody sold an AVG uh, antivirus software to them. And they proudly told me they had an antiviral that is unlimited and that is forever. There's nothing like an unlimited <laughs> antivirus uh, forever. You have to renew your antivirus and licenses annually. And genuine antivirus software cost money. They are not free. You have to spend money uh, to ensure that at least the first line of defense, which is antivirus, is, is, is operational in your institution. Now, what do hackers do? Um, hackers are very interesting people. They are very sophisticated. When a hacker wants to crack or break into your system, it doesn't matter how long uh, you would have to wait. The wait, if it's a year or two years, the motivation is to prove a point that your system is not secure, it's not safe. What they do is uh, they undertake a reconnaissance. You know, reconnaissance, they spy. They come and spy. They use social engineering to try and find out who is in charge uh, of the organization, uh, what is his username, uh, what is his email address, can they get a cell phone number? They go online and check your social media platform. You get a lot more detail from the next uh, presentation on how it is done. They also scan your ecosystem to identify open ports and also uh, identify what they call it, the number of servers and devices you have connected to the internet. And then they gain access to your system from the information that they have collected from their reconnaissance and scanning. And then once they gain access to their system, they figure out what to do, whether to steal your data and change it. And you have to maintain the system and clean the facts so you don't catch them. So when you run any forensics on your infrastructure, you will not catch them. So the only group of people who uh, do these who can uh, identify whether your system has been breached are ethical hackers. They have tools and, and also sophisticated technology that they, they deploy in carrying out penetration tests to your system to identify your vulnerabilities and threats also. And uh, the next presenter will speak extensively on it and do a live demo on how it is done. And I believe it will be a fantastic uh, experience. So what are the 10 uh, common attack vectors that are used by uh, this group of people? So in carrying out the, the five phases, the reconnaissance, the scanning, the gaining access, the maintaining access, and also uh, clearing your tracks, has, uh, hackers employ these uh, tools, these attack uh, vectors. So they look at uh, vulnerabilities, your know, softwares. Um, there are people who uh, develop softwares for their organizations in-house. Uh, much as I do not uh, recommend the practice, uh, I, I, I agree to the fact that if you're an IT professional or a programmer and you have um, uh, software design and development competences and skill set, make sure you follow best practices when you do that. Make sure you you would get some expert to review and I take some quality assurance on the system that you have rolled out to ensure uh, that there are no uh, bugs or errors that can be uh, compromised, that will compromise your uh, organization, your, your credentials, that is your login credentials, uh, they seek to uh, compromise your login and credentials and the key login credential they're interested in it as always is your administrator uh, passwords. Um, so you don't share your administrator systems, administrator passwords. Uh, you make sure it's, it's strong and complex. It's not a weak password. Um, you also keep an eye on disgruntled and malicious uh, employ employees because they can uh, get to also uh, be a major source of threat to your institution. You ensure you have a strong encryption system for your data, uh, data addressed, uh, data in use, uh, data in transit. 
uh, have systems in place to also uh, identify and also uh, have uh, mitigating a solution for either malware and uh, spyware and viruses like the ransomware. Be mindful of phishing and technique. Be, be careful how uh, devices are configured. Uh, IT people must not behave like herbal medicine. Okay, uh, one size uh, fits all. Uh, you must understand that when it comes to net configuring of networking and routers and access points, leave it for the network uh, administrators, certified network administrators, certified network engineers. Do not try uh, to make technical training uh, to do. Especially firewalls, it will be a great disaster to misconfigure a firewall because the firewall is designed to prevent unauthorized uh, access. So then, if it's misconfigured, you are better off not even having a firewall at all. You must also have trust relationship and also have um, systems in place to prevent uh, distributed denial of service uh, attacks. Okay. So I have made mention of. Attack vectors, uh, you need to know what an attack vector is. And also, in the cyber security space, you need to understand what we mean by an attack surface. Okay, so an attack vector refer refers to the pathway used by a hacker to access or penetrate your targeted uh, system. I mean, hackers love it when you have uh, people who don't have any knowledge, any technical knowledge in IT in charge of your. Health IT infrastructure. Okay, so uh, if a person says that he doesn't believe in uh, antivirus, okay, um, he also uh, thinks the internet is the safest place to uh, uh, operate, and also uh, they they can develop any software and use it on the network without going through any uh, security and quality assurance programs. You have you have created uh, a vector for. The hacker that will use it to exploit your your system. Okay, so these hackers will steal data and information uh, by investigating your known uh, vector and also exploit the vulnerabilities. For instance, deploying an access point. Uh, most institutions do it. They deploy an access point and then have a password and then share the password. So, like if the hundred uh, users or the hundred users. Uh, use that password. It's it's, it's 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 fun because then you all you need to do is identify who are the end users and you can easily gain access to the router or network used for broadcasting the Wi-Fi uh, signal. So what then is an attack surface? So the attack surface is the number of all the possible vectors that are available uh, to the network. Uh, ecos in the network ecosystem, okay, in which an authorized uh, user can access your data health infrastructure and extract data. So let me give you a demonstration. So I, I decided to capture the data health uh, ecosystem um, in the health sector. Okay, so in the health sector, typical, every typical uh, health care industry uh, institution, most of them, they use software. So either the software is for basic uh, office computing, Microsoft Office, or they have an ERP for payroll processing for preparing financial uh, uh, statements, or a health and, and electronic health information a system that is a hospital information uh, management system. Or if it's a smart hospital, they have intelligent building management system where your lighting system, your your AC, your doors, and and also other uh, utilities are connected to your network infrastructure via uh, network cable. Okay, there are several uh, software applications uh, during the COVID-19 we introduce contact tracing uh, softwares. There are softwares for uh, tracking COVID-19, uh, 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 not only tracking COVID-19 patients, but also it's integrated into your 
your electronic uh, health uh, records uh, to make sure that if you say somebody is negative or positive, it is negative and positive. There are software applications that also uh, I use for uh, patient engagement. By patient engagement, if your details is captured on the uh, electronic health records, they, they send you SMS uh, routinely and provide details for follow ups and and drug refill. So, so every healthcare institution provide software. Now, can you imagine if you have a big, you have a very big healthcare institution and your ecosystem is about uh, 5,000 computers and, and, and you use uh, pirated or, or counterfeit Microsoft operating system, Windows 10 and Microsoft Office uh, 2019 Office, you don't patch it regularly, you don't, you don't care um, your, your proprietary software which was developed by a vendor, never gets to be a patch. This is a lovely situation for any hacker to exploit and gain access to your, your system. So if you have one facility, healthcare facility, and you have one desktop, your attack surface is that one desktop computer. But if you have 100 desktop computers, and maybe you've deployed 5,000 tablets, and, and you have a mobile app, medical mobile app that you use to collect data and use of contact tracing, then you have a very wide and expansive uh, attack surface and, and you need to focus on how to protect your uh, ecosystem. The same applies to your network uh, infrastructure. Your sophisticated, the level of uh, sophistry of your network infrastructure is can also be exploited by any hacker. Uh, currently, most of our uh, digital medical diagnostic equipment run on artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, applications. So uh, these artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, systems uh, provide expert uh, advice or expert uh, support uh, systems to uh, physicians in their diagnosis. So they are used for clinical diagnosis. They, are, they can be used for surgery. Uh, they can be used for clinical uh, analysis. And they can be used in the pharmaceutical industry uh, to check your drug uh, uh, reactions. So when these devices which run artificial intelligence and machine learning systems have bugs, they can also be exploited. I made mention of the use of tablets. So M Health is the use of tablets and mobile apps and internet uh, in, the, in the delivery of clinical care. So it's the COVID-19 disrupted our traditional brick and mortar system of, of uh, providing care. So in order to ensure a continuum of care, so if you're a patient and you visit the hospital, uh, you visit a brick and mortar hospital and you make contact with a doctor once, um, chances are that you might not want to go there again and you would be introduced or asked to roll on to their telemedicine app. So this telemedicine app also introduced another risk to the network uh, ecosystem because then you have, patient, you have patients who are now connecting to the hospital's uh, electronic health records directly or through whatever middleware that has been uh, implemented. Now you need to be mindful of the source of the data that is originating from the, the patient. The patient is using or connecting to your platform um, with a system that is heavily infected with viruses and spyware, you can be assured that you would be uh, infected if you don't have some security systems in place to filter um, uh, data that is, in, uh, uh, what do you call it, being transmitted into your, or integrated into your network infrastructure and software uh, application. Currently, most of our uh, MRIs and uh, CT scans and ultrasounds are, are computers on its own. They are motherboards. They are software applications running on them. These devices get to be integrated into a, a network uh, infrastructure through an API. Do you know what is in the API? And do you know the security embedded in that API? Does it compromise your hospital infrastructure? Um, any hacker interested in hitting your system looks at all these uh, what do you call it, uh, your uh, attack surfaces, and then decide which of them can be easily exploited. Where is your uh, hospital information management system and other software application? Is it hosted in-house or is hosted in the cloud? 
is hosted in the cloud, the cloud computing services that is being offered. What is the security uh, on that on a cloud uh, service uh, uh, provider's uh, platform? Can it be hacked? Has it been hacked before? What are the channels of it being hacked? Okay, so what are the uh, platforms or uh, internet access that you have or you use in accessing data uh, on the cloud computing uh, resources platform? Do you just connect through a naked internet service uh, providers uh, connectivity platform or you have a virtual private network which is a secure channel for accessing or connecting to uh, systems uh, with very sensitive and critical information systems. We must be mindful of the fact that in healthcare, we are bound by uh, several legal regulatory framework to address issues relating to the privacy of patient data, the confidentiality, the integrity, as well as the availability of, of, of the patient uh, data, whether it's clinical or non-clinical. Um, how do you deal with social media? Is it possible for somebody to hack into your social media account and use it as a basis to uh, a basis for putting out uh, fake news about some healthcare, um, uh, you know, profile? Uh, for instance, uh, for those of you who would record during the COVID-19 era, there was a lot of fake news about about COVID-19. There's still some uh, fake, a lot of fake news on the vaccines that have been provided. Uh, the question is, was those fake news provided or made available by healthcare institutions or it was done by a hacker? When your social media credentials are compromised and information on your organization's platform is changed, would you even notice that this is not the information that was put out? Okay, there's also the IT security uh, deployment or implement, implementation in most uh, hospitals. So do you have a firewall? If you do have a firewall, how is it configured? Do you have CCTVs? How is your CCTV integrated to your network uh, infrastructure? Can the videos of CCTVs be easily be accessed uh, and used? Um, I spoke about telemedicine, um, the use of uh, mobile uh, devices, uh, tablets, uh, mobile apps, and internet connectivity for the purposes of bridging a digital divide between healthcare institutions in the remote locations and in the specialist locations, especially in the teaching hospital. Uh, what is the secure channel that is used? Uh, the payment platform. So how secure? If your hospitals admit um, or accepts uh, payment uh, get uh, platforms, mobile money, Visa, how secure is your is your system? Where is the data uh, resided? Can it be easily assessed? When I did the analytics on uh, the importance of breached patient uh, data, you realize that the payment details was of prime importance anytime there is a breach. So you want to know your username, and your password, your PIN number, your, your social, your devices when you use it to pay on the, the hospital's uh, platform, whether it's online or in-house. And um, there's also the fact that, an undeniable fact that uh, data sources from uh, in the healthcare industry uh, come from multiple sources. Actually, healthcare delivery is an information intensive industry. You, you have data from X-ray, uh, MRI uh, devices. You have data from the pharmacy unit. You have data from lab. You have uh, data from the home uh, and household services in terms of food that is served. You have data from uh, the medical doctors concerning the patient's uh, diagnosis. You have data from the nurses' workstation. There's the multiplicity of data from various sources that sets it, sets it apart from other industries. How do you protect all these? Uh, data sources. What about emerging technology like Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, uh, uh, the use of usage of blockchain in, in the healthcare uh, delivery uh, 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 systems. And then there is also the fact that you have to manage people, both physicians and non-physicians. So you have the doctor, the nurses, the, the lab uh, uh, 
technicians, the physiotherapists, as well as the IT professionals, the accountants, the, the group, the whole group of people who come together to provide care and delivery. These are very uh, risky uh, people or can be very risky and can be the weakest link if you have not taken place to taking the time or put in place measures to carry out um, some cyber security awareness training for them. Then interoperability, how are your systems connected to, together? Um, what do you, you do you use? APIs, do you have a, do you use a middleware to connect those uh, systems? Because you can, it can be exploited through um, uh, what we call a man in the middle uh, attack. So you have a front facing uh, system and then you have a middleware and then which is also connected to another system. I like to use the banking uh, application as an example. So let's say Rate Hospital has electronic information management system. Now Rate Hospital has engaged the services of a bank called Bank B to collect cash. Now this Bank B would either connect to Rate Hospital's uh, systems directly, which is not recommended, or they connect through a middleware. Now that middleware, that serves as the interface between the Rate Hospital's hospital information management system and the banking software application. Do you have an idea what is going on there? Because they can be exploited to by any hacker to gain access, unauthorized access to your system. Then also there's the several legal regulatory framework which needs to be complied with. So this in a nutshell is the healthcare ecosystem, which is available to the hacker. And as I mentioned earlier, this has a massive attack surface and anybody who wants to hack into a health, uh, health IT infrastructure can use whatever attack vectors that um, um, is available. So you must know the difference between what an attack vector is and also what the attack surface is. Because you are not doing your organization a big uh, favor or you are doing, you'll be doing your organization a big disfavor if all you are interested in is buying laptops and buying desktops and buying several uh, software applications without thinking about the risk uh, it, it poses to the patient and, and also the organization in this entirety. Now, so all the devices or systems I showed to you uh, generates what we call the big data. And this big data must be protected at all costs because it, it is key in providing uh, data for uh, clinical and non-clinical decision making. Now, there are various stages of data. You must also be clear in your mind what you need to do. Now, this data that is being generated from the various devices uh, can be categorized into three areas. First, there's the data address, there's the data in motion, and the data in use. So data address is, is data that has been backed up and stored is on a UPS uh, USB drive, it's in the cloud and it's stored in an archive. Okay, so those of you who have external storages with corporate data on it is data address. And this data address, you must you must declare in your mind what what it, the state in which it is. Is it encrypted? It, it, have you secured it? Said that when you lose it, it will not pose a threat to uh, patients and details. Then there is also the data in motion. I made mention of telemedicine, teleradiology, telelaboratory. So you do a video consult using your cell phone or a tablet from whichever location you are, either in the district or the community or community level, with a specialist at the, at the teaching hospital, say Kolebu Teaching Hospital. That, that communication taking place or that data that is shared between the two locations, what is happening to it? Because it can be uh, intercepted So you tell the then there's also the data in you. So as uh, for instance, my PowerPoint presentation that I'm taking now is data in use. So I'm using it, and it can be a hacker can exploit it and change whatever I have on this slide that you are seeing and, and present with some slide that will not is not uh, consistent or doesn't address what I want to talk about. So you must also be mindful of this set of categories. Um, regarding your ecosystem and the fact that 
the hacker also has an opening here to exploit it to access your system and either steal your data or temper with the information you have on your service. So why are healthcare institutions and juicy and easy uh, targets? And, 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 and you bear with me that, I mean, uh, IT governance, uh, poor IT governance is a major issue when it comes to uh, IT. Uh, first and foremost, I, I think the IT is the least invested in when it comes to the use of uh, uh, technology. Um, um, when you compare IT industry, with the, the healthcare industry with the banking industry, you realize that the kind of investment that is made into the use of technology in the banking sector is nowhere, uh, comparing with the health sector, is, 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 is so huge that, I mean, you, you we can't catch up or we, we need to have an international strategy. Now, IT governance, it's simply the uh, the implementation of some systems and guidelines to promote the effective and efficient use of, of technology and also ensure that organizations and directives and goals and, and also plans are, are, are met. Unfortunately, in the healthcare industry, especially in our ecosystem, um, I have not gained a lot. If you are the helm of uh, health IT infrastructure or the middle of uh, healthcare uh, uh, digitalization, uh, being people who don't have any technical uh, certification, they have zero academic uh, uh, qualification, they have no proficiency in the use of technology, and they have absolutely no clue about the ecosystem. Okay, so once you have set breakdown in IT governance, it is a major challenge because then if you have an overbearing uh, uh, senior manager, that senior manager can make very ridiculous uh, uh, decisions. I'll speak in much more details in, in IT governance in one of my slides. So I just want you to understand that poor IT governance is a major issue and it's one of the reasons why uh, hackers uh, have a fuse day when it comes to healthcare. Because people don't understand uh, uh, the relationship between IT and the provision of, of clinical care. They don't engage people with the expertise uh, to ensure the proper alignment between the technology and healthcare uh, delivery. And sometimes when you even advise them, they don't listen. Okay, then there is also the big data that I spoke about. The big data on sensitive clinical information has a very high online market value. So uh, is a great, there's a great motivation to break into health IT infrastructure because when you have the healthcare data, you can sell it on the dark web and make big money out of it. Data that is used for clinical decision making is, is shared among several stakeholders. The doctor has access to the patient data, the nurse has access to the patient data. The pharmacist has access to the patient data. The lab technician has a, or lab manager has access to the patient data. The finance officials have access to the patient data. All of it for either clinical or non-clinical decision making. Now, this creates challenges for access, uh, control, and defining uh, identity uh, accesses and, and also privileges uh, when it comes to sharing the, uh, and accessing data. Of course, yes, one route or way to ensure that data uh, available in the healthcare, on, on healthcare, on patients, uh, meet the test of the privacy, confidentiality, and integrity is to use a role based uh, model in terms of access control. So, by the role based, role based model, the doctor sees only what he's supposed to see. The accountant sees only what he's supposed to see. The pharmacy sees what he or she is supposed to see. But the fact of the matter is that the, all of these people have access to the same data. And once the login credentials of the pharmacy uh, is breached, the whole system is compromised. We also have several medical diagnostics uh, equipment, which are also easy point of entry. Now, these medical diagnostic equipment are also integrated to the network 
infrastructure and sometimes also connected to the internet for the purposes of providing third party uh, support uh, uh, on those uh, devices. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the MRI, the CT scan, the ultrasound are all now computed. They have motherboards. You have to assign them IP addresses. They have e e APIs which must also be integrated to the network infrastructure. The images generated by these devices are also connected to the what we call the PAC, uh, picture archiving and communication system service. And then they must also be configured so that the patient data uh, or images can be accessible by the physician who needs to look at the X-ray machine. So it's very complicated when you have to manage all these devices that require, um, you know, very structured and defined uh, configuration as well as meet uh, uh, configuration protocols such as the DICOM standard. Interestingly, several or most healthcare institutions have no digital transformation strategy. You cannot move from a paper-based healthcare delivery system into a digitized environment uh, with the purposes of undertaking digitalization of paperless uh, hospital without a strategy. Okay, so I also speak about it in my one of the subsequent slides. You must definitely have strategy on how you move from a manual system to a digital system, and also how you sustain the digitalization environment. In order, in order to ensure continuity in your business or clinical operations. Okay, so. Why, why do healthcare institutions get to be breached, get to be attacked by hackers? Okay, so traditionally or conventionally, we refer to the perimeter uh, security as a way of uh, protecting your uh, IT infrastructure. So we protect the IT infrastructure or software system by erecting what we call a firewall. So a firewall in the lay terms can be described as a wall. So it's a wall that prevents people from gaining unauthorized uh, systems, uh, unauthorized access to your uh, digital health uh, system. So the green uh, arrow shows the firewall, which is the brick. Okay, now to gain access, to ensure that you will define your security uh, architecture and security protocols clearly, you set up what we call a gateway. So, uh, and I'm speaking literally, that you have, a, you have a wall with a gate, and to be able to get through the wall and get to the house, you need to go to a gate, and to be able to get to the gate, you need to have some login credential. Typically, it must be a key if it is a house to open the gate. So, this is how you traditionally or conventionally, you protect your network infrastructure. Okay, now, what happens most of the time is that these firewalls are breached by decisions we make inadvertently. For instance, um, a window is created in this firewall, or a gap is created in this firewall. If you procure software applications, use them on your network, that have, that have not stand the test of time. The software applications have not been uh, have not passed any quality assurance test. Nobody has tested them to check if there are bugs or any errors in the application. Not only that, you also uh, employ managers who don't have a clue uh, uh, what they are doing. They'll be arguing with you over simple issues like uh, software uh, applications and, and, and buying laptop for uh, IT professionals uh, uh, to use. It is, it's, it's not a good uh, idea. So they create a vulnerability. And uh, another vulnerability is created when uh, management uh, decides to sanction the use of fake and counterfeit operating uh, system on your, on your network uh, infrastructure. So if you have a thousand uh, laptops, you, your thousand laptops comprise of fake operating system. And, and when I say fake operating system, you download the Operating system, and then you crack it and make it look real. When you do that, you automatically uh, breach the security architecture of the devices. And if it's used on your network infrastructure, you provide easy access to anyone who wants to gain unauthorized access. So the scanning process in the 
uh, five steps that hackers, certified ethical hackers use is if aimed at ensuring these identify these gaps on your network infrastructure that will be exploited and used to cause damage in your uh, institution. The other and breaches is where people are not trained. Okay, so you have uh, staff, especially staff who manage the patient critical systems, do not undergo any routine uh, training. I, I I have a friend who tells me for him is very good in Windows XP, and true. He used to be very good at Windows XP, but I get to tell him, listen, we are running a system now which is called Microsoft uh, Professional Windows 10. So uh, how good you are is, is not a good, a good idea or it's not really worthwhile when you come to an environment and using Windows 10 Professional. And that person is a major risk because you'll be configuring or undertaking several misconfiguration in the in the Windows 10 environment without knowing that we are creating opportunities for uh, or creating vulnerabilities in the ecosystem, thereby breaching whatever security architecture that has been set up. So to address all these challenges, you need to understand that uh, cyber security critical factors are three key. You need to identify the people issues, uh, the process issues, and the issues also relating to your technology and security infrastructure. What are the legal and regulatory frameworks? Okay, so you cannot, you are not required to undertake uh, any digitalization implementation without complying with the legal and regulatory frameworks. So the key legal and regulatory frameworks are uh, NETA, the Cyber Security Authority, the Data uh, Protection Commission, and the Ghana. Uh, audit service. These are the regulators, and each of these regulators are, are governed or they have acts that uh, mandate them to undertake certain activities. Okay, so under the section 55 of the electronic transaction, are given the critical important role that healthcare plays in the in the country or in any ecosystem. The Act uh, 772 recognizes the healthcare. Uh, services as a protected computer and critical uh, database. The Cyber Security Act, which uh, 2020, which was recently uh, promulgated, Section 35, also designates the health uh, services as a critical information uh, infrastructure. What this designation means that once you are operating in the healthcare uh, industry and you decide to undertake any digitalization, you must be bound. You are bound by these two uh, legal regulatory uh, frameworks, as well as the one related to the Data Protection Act. So I am going to take a deep dive into what these legal regulatory frameworks seek to uh, talk about or let us know concerning unauthorized access, which is hacking in the ecosystem. So under the Data Protection Act, uh, patients are really empowered under the act to, to to what they call it, uh, take institutions on when it comes to the use of uh, technology. For instance, under Section 77 of the Data Protection Act, a patient or a person, of course we are talking about healthcare, I'll substitute the patient, who is affected by the process of his, his, any personal data may on the person's own behalf or on behalf of another person, request the commissioner to make assessment as to whether the process is in compliance with the provisions of this act. So typically, a patient who is in a hospital and who is dissatisfied about uh, services that is provided and also suspicious of the IT system that have been put in place in the delivery of care can, can, can request or make a complaint to the Data Protection Commission and request for an assessment to be undertaken whether the hospital or healthcare institution has complied with the provisions of the act. Okay, and that patient or person, after the assessment is taken and is found, the hospital is found to have breached uh, the provisions of the data protection act, can sue. So under section 43, it says where an individual suffers damage or distress, through the contravention by a data controller of the requirement of the act, that the individual is entitled to compensation 
from the data controller for the damage or distress. So it means that if a patient sues and the patient wins, the hospital would have to compensate the person by paying cash. So When a hospital uh, database system or IT infrastructure data uh, protection act. And I and I put uh, has been accessed or acquired by an authorized person. So you see, there's an authorized person which is uh, who processes the data. So it doesn't speak about the host, speak about the a third party processing data. So the vendor who supplied or provided the software, who is also uh, data would have to notify uh, of the so breach under section 28 of the act. The data controller would have to take the necessary steps to ensure that the institution puts in place serious IT security governance uh, and systems. Okay, so. Now, what is the what is the data controller supposed to do? Um, under the Data Protection Act, a data controller is an individual or a person who has impl implemented a technology solution, which is also used to collect uh, data on, on individuals. So, the data controller is supposed that the hospital organization is supposed to make sure they embrace or adapt uh, robust IT security governance. Uh, platforms or, or protocols, and this they are supposed to do by, by ensuring that they have to secure the integrity of the personal data and uh, can substitute it with the patient data in their possession. And what do they do? When you look at the act, is clear by the adoption of the appropriate, reasonable, technical, and organizational measures. So this is not left to the whims and caprices of, of a manager. If you are a manager of a hospital or an organization, you can do what you want. The law is clear. You have to adapt the appropriate, reasonable, technical, and operational measures to prevent loss or damage or unauthorized destruction, unlawful access. Um, then session two talks about the fact that the data controller must also uh, identify reasonable, foreseeable internal and external risk. What this session is talking about is from time to time, you must engage the services of a cyber security professional to undertake penetration testing activities to identify your vulnerabilities and, and, and also weaknesses and what steps to take to uh, address them. You have to put in place the appropriate uh, safeguards and, and risk and also make sure that you implemented the appropriate uh, uh, systems to protect the patient uh, data. Uh, you are also required to comply with generally accepted information practice a procedure. So this section alone talks about serious IT uh, security department or directorate in healthcare institution. Uh, IT security cannot be left in the hands of uh, the offices. Uh, you cannot also uh, do what you want. Uh, IT security professionals need to be provided with all the logistics and, and tools they need to undertake their uh, job function so that in the event of a breach, they can uh, testify that they took the appropriate step to uh, prevent the hacker from coming uh, or gaining unauthorized access to the system. Now, I'm also going to talk about what does the Cyber Security Act uh, uh, talk about? 
hacking. Now, the Cyber Security Act also says that uh, under Section 40, that a person shall not, without authorization, secure access or attempt to secure access to any network uh, infrastructure. If you recall in my earlier print, one of my earlier sites, uh, slides, I indicated that hackers undertake two main activities. They undertake activities that can be described as ethical, and they undertake activities that can be described as unethical. So the law, the Cyber Security Act is giving effect to that understanding, to the effect that a person shall not without authorization. So what it means is that if you are a certified ethical hacker, you can gain or help your institution uh, to identify their vulnerabilities by gaining authorization or ensuring that it is approved. But why you do not have any uh, authorization to undertake uh, any unauthorized access, you would be, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, deemed to have contravened the section and also committed an offense, uh, which you can be in prison uh, up to two years and also pay some fines. Then also, the Cyber Security Act identifies the fact that once you own an institution, a healthcare institution that can be defined or designated as a critical information infrastructure, you have to report any cyber security breach within 24 hours. Section 39, self section 1A, says that the owner of a critical information infrastructure shall report a cyber security incident within 24 hours. It is clear. When there's a cyber security breach, you have to report it. It is clear that you have to report to the cyber security uh, authority. Uh, you must report to the, the sectoral computer emergency response team or the national cyber security emergency response team. You don't report to national security. You don't report to, to Ghana Police Service. You don't report this issue to the BNI. You don't report it to uh, the IGP. So that, uh, no, you don't do that. And once you do not comply with this directive, it says under Section 2 um, uh, CI that you are liable to pay to the authority an administrative penalty. So once again, you must be clear in your mind that when there is a breach in your network infrastructure or a hacker breaches your network infrastructure, the, the mandated institution that deals with it is the National Cyber Security Authority and not national security or IGP or Ghana Police Service. Or, um, and you don't, you don't do that. They are not in a position to help you. And when you breach this directive, you'll be contravening the act and you could uh, find some amount of money. The report must be done within 24 hours. Um, the Cyber Security Act also defines uh, what they call it, an incident point of contact. An incident point of contact is, so when there's a breach, what do you do? Okay, so um, it has come up with this uh, incident point of contact. So the incident point of contact is where, in the event that there's a breach, you, and a breach means a hacker has hacked into your system, there's a major security incident that has affected your ability to perform as a, a healthcare institution. And these are the contact details. There's a contact detail for WhatsApp, you can send an email, you can SMS, you can go online and fill the form, you can call, and you can also use their mobile app to report a cyber security breach for help. A cyber security incident is a highly uh, specialized uh, event that requires uh, skill sets, unique skill sets to identify and address it and, and prevent a uh, widespread uh, spread of it. So you have to follow the proper the procedures and do not inform people who are not mandated and that they act to try and help you out. They will not be in a position to do that. Okay, so in the wisdom of the drafted of the act, they identified that the putting in place an institutional arrangement or structure to address the national. Uh, to meet to the comply with the National Cyber Security uh, Act could be complicated and difficult. So the Minister of Communication, uh, as per Section 38 uh, of the Act, has prescribed a minimum and standards of prohibitions in the management 
in the general management of a critical information infrastructure. So if your healthcare institution has been designated as a critical information infrastructure, your minimum requirements for meeting uh, compliance with the network infrastructure that must be set up is defined under the Act, and, and you cannot put in place any system that you want or you deem fit. Okay, so under the Electronic Transaction Act, it's an, it's an illegality under Section 118 for a person to secure an authorized access or attempt to secure an authorized access to a protected system. So Section 118 says that a person who secures an authorized access or attempt to secure access to a protected system in contravention of the provision commits an offense. And when we are, we are caught, uh, there's a penalty of 5,000 units. A penalty unit, the last time I checked, was 12 cities. So it means 60,000 cities or a term of imprisonment of 10 years. So uh, hacking uh, or gaining unauthorized access to uh, uh, healthcare infrastructure or any organization infrastructure is an illegality and a crime under the Electronic Transaction Act. Okay, you are not also required to um, gain unauthorized access to uh, IT infrastructure. Section 124 also says that a person who intentionally access or intercepts, so I mentioned in my presentation that in the use of telemedicine system, there is uh, data transmission between two parties and it involves data uh, in transit. You, you are not supposed to put in place a system that will intercept the data uh, that is uh, transmitted between uh, a patient and a physician using a teleradiology or tele laboratory platform. And when you contravene it, there is also a penalty and a jail term of uh, five years and, uh, and beyond or both, okay? Under Section 117, under the Electronic Transaction Act, a person who uses electronic medium or electronic agent, whether in part or in whole, is deemed to have caused an event negligently, if without intending to cause the event. I mean. I guess most of you might be familiar with the situation where non-IT professional, people who do not have academic uh, education, they do not have technical certification. They have no proficiency in the use of IT, make decisions. And then when it becomes a problem, they will tell you that they didn't know. They will be caught under this act, which, which defines that uh, uh, practice as a criminal negligence. And, and it's, it's one act I'm very particular of because it also goes on to say that uh, people without the skill and care that has reasonable necessary under a circumstance must not uh, undertake uh, any decision relating to a subject matter. If you're a, a database administrator, do not try to configure a switch because you do not have that skill and care that are reasonable necessary when it comes to configuring uh, what you call it, a router. So just stay in your uh, database. Don't crisscross. If you are an administrator, an accountant, or a clinician, or whoever you are, and you have not had formal training, don't don't just get yourself involved in an ecosystem where it's very complicated. You'll be found guilty under this act, and it also comes with a very heavy jail term uh, called uh, uh, classified under the criminal negligence. Then also, the act also goes on to say that a person who intentionally engages in a conduct, and I've highlighted the conduct because sometimes. Um, the professionals who need equipment and resources to undertake their activities are treated with you know, disrespect and disdain. And, and people who do that, especially those in top management position, think that they are doing an IT professional favor, probably by giving them a high-end laptop with uh, network monitoring and software monitoring tools. This law will catch those managers who have not taken steps or put in place measures to ensure that IT professionals are provided with the necessary uh, resources and, and uh, uh, what you call it, tools to cover uh, or implement or undertake their activities. And when they are found guilty, there's a, there is a penalty of 5,000 units, which is 60,000 Ghana cities, and an impri imprisonment term of not more than and 10 years. So once again, uh, we have to caution managers who think because they can do WhatsApp, they can do Facebook, uh, they can uh, configure some uh, com uh, communication gadget, their IT, and should take over 
a function that might be performed by cybersecurity or IT professional is a very dangerous uh, activity to be undertaking. You cannot hide and say some at some point in time that uh, you, you are not a technical person because under this act, uh, section 134, you would have been deemed to have misconducted yourself and have engaged in an Ill illegality and would be prosecuted. The, the expression that is, oh, we are not a technical person, you are the technical people, it will not help you. You just stay away and empower the professionals to undertake their activities. Under Section 132, a person who knowingly and without authority discloses a password and access code uh, or other means of gaining access to a program or electronic uh, record uh, commits an offense. And this is very heavy. And it's 20 years. So, so security is key. Securing your network infrastructure or, or systems or IT infrastructure, whatever it is that you are using in a digitalization activity in the healthcare industry, needs to be secured. I was recently asked to hand over my, uh, my access to the server room to a third party. Okay, and I and I resisted because I'm mindful of this uh, uh, provision of the act. Okay, so if you without knowingly and without authority disclose password, access code, which is the key means of gaining access to an infrastructure or a system or a device that eventually can be led to a breach or gives unauthorized access to a third party, and they are found guilty, it's 20 years, and you don't want to do that. A couple of months ago, I had to manage a situation where a medical director of an institution was asking an IT manager to hand over the login, full login credential, username, password of their switches and routers and and servers to a third party because they want to install a hospital information management system. And I thought it was not only a dangerous thing to do, but it was ridiculous that uh, this should happen uh, when we are talking about privacy, securing the privacy and confidentiality of patient uh, data, because you don't know what a person will do when they have unrestricted access to your network infrastructure. Then once again, you are required to consult the Minister of Communication and, and managing uh, your network uh, infrastructure. Okay, so under section 59, the minister, which is the minister of communication has prescribed minimum standards. And these minimum standards are the standard that you use in the, uh, used uh, by NETA or have been provided by NETA. So there are standards on the local area network. And then finally, when you are breached, your system is breached and you are sued and it goes to court, the test, the litmus test is section seven, which is the admissibility and evidential weight of an electronic record. So this is the test you'll be subjected to your IT infrastructure and, and everybody in charge of your IT infrastructure will have to explain this and determine whether uh, the uh, person who sued uh, win the case or not. So in assessing the evidential weight of an electronic record, the court, it's not a manager or a team or a steering committee. This is a court matter. So you'll be standing before a judge, probably in a court uh, uh, of competent jurisdiction, and be asked questions on the reliability and manner of, or in which your electronic record was generated, displayed, and stored, or communicated, the reliability of the manner in which the integrity of the information was maintained, the manner in which its originator was identified, and other facts that the courts may consider uh, relevant. So. How do you manage this ecosystem? The first thing you do in managing this ecosystem in order to address or prevent unauthorized access is to institutionalize IT governance. So I've already spoken extensively about IT governance. So IT governance is the responsibility of the board of directors and the executive manager. Every institution's uh, board or management committee must be interested in IT as well as the head. You must be interested. Board members must be interested because you don't want an executive management, which is the DG or medical director or regional director, um, managing or running the IT infrastructure based on his, his or her whims and, and caprices and, and making decisions that will cause uh, patient or put patient life uh, at risk. You don't want that to happen. Um, the institution must be mindful of the ramifications of, of any breaches their network infrastructure. And it consists of leadership, organizational structures, and processes uh, that are put in place to extend organizations 
the use of technology. There must be a well-defined organizational structure. There must not be confusion. There must be who, there must be identified who is in charge. And whoever is in charge must have the academic qualification and technical competences to do that. Um, you must also as a step or guide in moving your digital transformation, understand that you need an enterprise architecture to uh, find your uh, digital transformation processes. And an enterprise architecture is a blueprint that helps you. The way you, if you have a parcel of land and you want to build a land, uh, you want to have a parcel of land and you want to build a house on it, you identify your washroom and your living room and how it should be connected. The same way you need to make sure that your organization systems are logically structured and, and connected. And then finally, this is food for top. So if you are a management member, a senior manager, and you are supposed to manage an, a network uh, infrastructure or a digital health ecosystem comprising of this, and you don't believe in uh, IT governance, you believe in sitting in your office and giving directive and changing things, you don't believe in an enterprise architecture, you, you don't believe in best practices and frameworks and standards and, and, and protocols. How are you going to manage this network, complicated network infrastructure, in order to prevent unauthorized access to your systems? And also be mindful of the fact that when you do not put in place the appropriate infrastructure and uh, hacker case on authorized access, You'll be held a uh, comparable and fund wanting under the several legal regulatory frameworks in the country. So I am done with my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a, a 10 minutes break. The questions, uh, I'll take questions after the overall uh, uh, webinar because uh, there will be my presentation and the next uh, speaker's presentation is seamlessly uh, integrated. So I don't get to be repeating. And myself, but uh, we'll take a 10 minutes break and then we'll come back and, and, and continue with the PowerPoint uh, presentations on the next step. Uh, the next speaker is a very respected uh, cybersecurity professional. Uh, I've spoken at length generally, but then I don't want you to miss the next session because now you're going to see what I'm talking about live. He's going to do it when we see unauthorized access. And, and he will not disappoint you. So uh, thank you very much for um, taking some time uh, to uh, participate in the program. And I shall take over after 10 minutes. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. OK, so we'd like to say a big thank you to Mr. Sankwashi for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we'll take a 10 minute break. But we'll be back and we'll continue with the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just do a sound check just to make sure you guys can hear me?
I'm just doing a sound check. Can you hear me? Hello, once again, I'd like to welcome you back. Uh, we are back from the break and we would like to begin with the second presentation by Mr. Ash, Head of Cybersecurity Quantum Security Solutions, Ghana. Um, Mr. Ash, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, just want to do a sound check. Can you hear me just fine? I hear you loud it's clear. Perfect. Perfect. So, good morning, everyone. Um, allow me to share my screen shortly. Uh, so, yeah, great presentation so far. Uh, thank you all for being on the call. Um, I'm just going to go through a, sort of a quick, short and, sort of short and sweet presentation on uh, sort of giving a bit of intro about myself. Maybe you guys. Uh, some pre-recorded demos, and if you have time, we do some live demo. Okay, so better do allow me to start. Can everyone see my screen? I see your screen. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a agenda about the uh, this presentation, um, so we're just going to go through briefly about who I am, uh, give you a bit of a company info of where I work at. Uh, we're going to go through uh, different phases of hacking, and we're going to go a bit, do a bit of a dive deep along with the tools. Uh, that are used. Uh, just wait a second. Let me just show you the right. Thing. I think I'm not showing the. Presentation. There we go. Uh, and then we're going to do a, a live demo along with prevention uh, sort of uh, explanations, a bit of a career path. Have a chance for questions and answers at the end of the call. Right. So. Who I am basically. So my name is Ash Tasmalchi. I've been in Ghana for the past uh, six years or so, uh, working with both uh, public and uh, private sector. I'm uh, also a chapter leader of uh, OWAS here in Ghana. Um, and uh, I've been working in the IT field for the past 40 years. Uh, 10 years of that has been in security, and this is something I studied. Uh, in UK. In Ghana, I worked with um, sort of tier one banks, the Central Bank of Ghana, various different ISPs, government, oil and gas, also recently with some uh, sort of health uh, sort of sector uh, organizations. In UK, uh, in the past and even currently, we worked with some high school banks, online retailers, and insurance companies. Uh, a little bit about our company, uh, where I work at, it's called Quantum Security Solutions. We are based here in Accra, Ghana. Uh, we've been around since 2011. We are be like a boutique sort of cyber security service and provide, uh, product provider. Uh, we have a team of qualified guys uh, that have various different exper experiences and backgrounds in IT. And uh, somehow we all turn our skills to security. So we have uh, something around 20 years of collective experience. Uh, we work with uh, FTSE 100 and Fortune 500 companies, and uh, mainly Ghana uh, focuses what we have done projects in Nigeria, UK, Abu Dhabi, and Dubai. Some of the present and past clients of ours are what you can see in front of you. Again, public sector and private sector. So anything from financial industry to ISPs to banks, uh, utility providers. Um, we work with them and assist them in various different ways in cyber projects. Audits, tests, and the likes. 
Um, so our service and products, very briefly, we do uh, sort of audit advisory, we do uh, incident detection, monitoring, and response for the likes of SIM and SOC. We provide a lot of training, uh, creating awareness, the likes of this sort of presentation, going sort of targeting high-level management, uh, going with the technical guys. We do program policy review, uh, we provide the usual endpoint security, network security, as well as application security and email security. Uh, some of the compliance and accreditations that we kind of line up ourselves with and we help organizations here in Ghana to align themselves with. Bear in mind, we're not affiliated with any of these organizations or our services are not endorsed by them. It's just that we are very, very aware of these standards being out there and we know that organizations are in Ghana that are trying to achieve uh, certain objectives internally, so we assist them in achieve, achieving these goals. So in, when it comes to banks, uh, the directive from the Central Bank of Ghana especially the PCI as well. Uh, ISO 27000 uh, is something that's going around a lot in Ghana recently. Uh, as was mentioned early on in the call, Data Protection Commission also have an act out since 2012. Uh, some companies we've seen that they deal with uh, sort of European citizen data, so we also help them with the uh, GDPR. These are some of our technology partners uh, that we work with in various different fields. Um, they have various different solutions where we kind of handpicked, uh, and I think we are, it's appropriate to the market here in Ghana. We are very, very, very aware of the challenges that governs our market when it comes to budgeting or sort of internal issues. And you know, you cannot uh, just bring a solution from anywhere in the world to just deploy it in Ghana and expect it to work. So we are. Really very aware of that. Uh, we work with our team and our clients here to make sure we have a successful project. One of the very exciting ones is Dog Trace. So I hope you can hear see the video on this. So I'm just going to play a very brief, quick video on Dog Trace, uh, a minute, just for you to get an understanding. So Dog Trace is basically uh, a cybersecurity solution which uses artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. It's something that we had tremendous success with here in Ghana. And uh, that, of course, a lot of information on the website. We are the reseller and the partner here in Ghana. But here's a very quick, uh, I think, 30, 40 second video to give you a bit of an intro. And then from there on, I will start my presentation. <laughs> Uh, so diving into the actual presentation. So phases of hacking, uh, I think Sam briefly touched up on this. Uh, so I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper and show you guys uh, at least a bunch of tools that the hackers use um, to sort of achieve each of these stages. So it goes through these sort of five main stages. And in case of an ethical hacker, which is actually need to report an issue to the company, uh, it has the last uh, final six stage. So reconnaissance, uh, scanning, gaining access, maintaining that access, and then clearing the trap. Now, recon reconnaissance is basically gathering information without interacting with the victim. So this can be done via the internet. It can be whilst connected to a network inside the LAN. Uh, it can be done using various different websites, uh, like we said earlier on, uh, social media, public records, LinkedIn, uh, and various different sort of uh, resources out there. Again, the whole idea is that we're not prompting the victim that we are out there and we're looking for this kind of information. Uh, there are a bunch of different sort of uh, tools out there on the internet, apart from the usual search engines. Uh, there's a tool, called, for example, called Shodan, which does basically scanning of the internet and um, it just shows all the sort of exposed services, firewalls, servers, along with IP addresses, along with potentially sometimes vulnerabilities. And uh, anyone who has an account on that website uh, can easily just go there and search for these IP addresses or search for a country and just pick up the details and then from there on launch the attack. Another website which also covers, uh, uh, sort of offers the same service is called Census. Again, does the same thing. The idea again is to 
scan the whole public record IP addresses, and it displays the information to users. Uh, of course, it can be used for both uh, sort of uh, uh, malicious and nefarious users. They can actually go and find vulnerabilities and start attacking. Some do. And of course, it can be used in-house yourself if you know what your public IP addresses of your company is. You can actually set up a monitoring solution whereby, like the, what we said early on, the have I been phoned with your passport, uh, where... Can you hear me fine now? Hear you. Okay, fine. Um, so it uh, allows you to monitor your IP addresses and in case there's any changes on your firewall settings, it prompts you instantly. So at least you know what your exposure is to the public world. Now, when it comes to scanning um, and hacking tools again, uh, so basically scanning is one stage after the reconnaissance. So now you know what the IP addresses are, you know what the websites are, you start mapping those networks, you start scanning the ports to find to see if there's any active ports, any hosts, any sort of vulnerabilities residing on those operating systems, networks, applications, servers, firewalls, switches, anything exposed externally to the internet. And in case you are on site, anything again exposed to the users, which you're not supposed to be. Uh, we've done sort of uh, some projects here in the past when we did pen tests. We go on site and you hear the typical, oh, everything's secure, nothing is uh, sort of, nothing can be hacked. And then within five minutes, once you run a, a port scanner, you start finding loads of uh, devices on the network with ports which are exposed, they're not supposed to be, and usually they're also running default passwords so you can get full administrative access to these devices. Some of the tools that are being used, uh, so there are a bunch of uh, sort of open source tools, if you like, and there's some proprietary tools as well. So Nmap, for example, is a network mapper. It's been around for ages. It's a very powerful tool. Um, which helps uh, sort of the ethical hackers or the network administrators with scanning networks. Uh, so the idea is you just give it IP address, you configure a bunch of different switches on the command line and say, okay, go and search this port to see if it's open and tell me what services is running. So this can be done both for internal and external IP addresses. Nixo is uh, also another open source tool which is used for uh, sort of finding vulnerabilities within websites. Uh, also, again, run on a command uh, command prompt. And you also have uh, proprietary tools like Qualys and Nessus, uh, which you have to pay for a license. Sometimes they offer like some sort of a trial period as well, quite uh, powerful. And they also allow uh, sort of organizations to run vulnerability scanners. Now, once you scan, you find a vulnerable port. Uh, now, the idea is you have to gain access. Uh, so you find, a, let's say, a vulnerable uh, open server, which is running some file server, let's say. Now, this is actually where the actual hack happens. So you gain access to those files. Uh, if you have admin bytes uh, as a hacker, what well, the first thing they try to do probably is deploy some exploits, uh, some ransomware, infect the machine, take the files out. So basically, they do this by leveraging on the weakness of the devices. And of course, this whole access is unauthorized because you never ask for, ask for any authorization from the company. You, know, you never ask for any consent. Uh, and it, of course, uh, involves attempting to send malicious payloads to these devices. Some of the tools again here, um, so for example, there's a web exploitation tool called Beef, which uh, injects codes into the browser. There's a very powerful tool called Metasploit, which is free of charge, running on the operating system Kali and also Parrot, or it can actually be installed on pretty much any Linux operating system. And it has a lot of built-in uh, exploits um, into it, so all you have to do as a hacker, as an ethical hacker, is to say, okay, I have a Windows machine, which I know is running a remote desktop connection, and I need all the exploits relative to this, and I just literally list all of them, and you can just sit there and try one by one until actually one of the exploits work, and you get full access to the uh, sort of server. The idea about this is that it's fairly automated, so you don't need to have too much knowledge of how to write scripts, everything's built into the tool. All you have to do is uh, point the gun and pull the trigger, so you get full access to the device like that. Of course, a proper hacker would cover the tracks, uh, they would do it in such a way that would not easily be found, but they can also be used in-house yourselves if you have, you know, I think we a mention of the uh, older Windows systems on the call early on. So if, let's say if you have an older Windows system, Windows XP, and you actually want to showcase it to someone how easily it can be hacked, Metasploit is a tool to go to. 
nmap that was mentioned earlier on. It also has a, a scripting engine, which has some scripts built into it, and also allows you to target various devices using that. Uh, there's also a thing called injection attacks. Uh, usually this happens on uh, applications or APIs or databases. So a SQL map, for example, as it comes with a name, it scans a SQL server. It can drop uh, sort of uh, exploits on the SQL servers and allows you full access to the databases if they're vulnerable, if they're running an older version, if they're running uh, sort of some sort of unsanitized data input or output where the validations and checks are not being done correctly. And this way you get full access to the server, uh, to the database server, and you can do various things. You can delete database, you can copy stuff, you can tamper with the data remotely. Another tool called Burp Suite, which is a, essentially a, a, a proxy server uh, for web applications. So this can be used for websites, APIs, uh, mobile applications, where there's Android or iOS, and the idea is that it intercepts the uh, data being sent back and forth uh, to the server and allows you to tamper with the input data and allow it to see information that a normal user would not see on a browser. Phishing, like we said earlier on, email is the biggest uh, sort of threat, at least in the health sector as well, and various other places. And there is a, sort of an open source tool out there uh, called SET, a social engineering attack. So uh, sorry, it's a social engineering uh, framework, which allows you to do social engineering attacks. So basically, the typical uh, email uh, sort of spams that we see, uh, it gets formed up in tools like this. So the idea is that you can sort of masquerade an uh, address, so it looks as if it's coming from a genuine sender, include a link, a payload, a PDF file, an exe file, and send it out, and also it tracks to see who clicked, who downloaded, and it gives you sort of full access to the device. Now, once you have access, uh, let's say to your operating system, to a server, or a machine, you need to maintain that access. So at some point, the admins would actually detect that, uh, that someone breached this, uh, the machines and the systems, and they might try to sort of wipe the uh, path, change the context and the firewall uh, to get rid of that uh, breach. So the idea with the proper hack is that usually they try to maintain access. By doing that is that they install backdoors. Uh, what we hear usually about the command and control servers. So the idea is that they somehow relay the traffic via different channels or mask the IP. So when he, someone's reviewed the locks on the firewall, on the switches, on the machine, they will not see uh, anything uh, malicious looking. So they will not detect anything. So in case actually they go around and block certain ports or run an antivirus or run an endpoint protection, uh, nine out of 10, the command and control servers can actually still maintain the access because uh, like one of the tools I mentioned at the very end, DNS to TCP, it relays basically TCP normal traffic to a DNS traffic. So from an admin perspective, from a network uh, sort of administrator, find them and pick up the TCP traffic, uh, a high volume of traffic going back and forth to unknown IP addresses and then they block that. But if they see DNS traffic, they would be less suspicious than that. Uh, so backdoors, root kits, Trojans, uh, or even when, you act, when the hackers get access to, uh, let's say, uh, Active Directory or somewhere that they can create users, they either try to create new users uh, and name them in a clever way to say admin one, admin two, or they'll try to escalate the uh, privilege they have on the current user in order to uh, get a better leverage in the organization. Now, once you've done all of that, you've done your hack, you've done your reconnaissance, you scanned, uh, you gain access, you've done your damage, you gain, you sort of uh, pull out all the information you wanted, or you infected the uh, device with some ransomware. Ideally, a hacker would clear the track, so in case there was supposed to be some sort of investigation after the attack, uh, no one can easily find them. So by doing this, they usually have scripts uh, that just runs through all the tools they had. Most of the times, it's actually automated as well, so they're not going to sit there one by one and start to run scripts and uninstall applications. And the whole idea is that you cover the entire track, anything from the connections when they came in, uh, the resources they access, the, the tamperings they've done, any changes they made. So they try to disable, clear, tamper any of the logs. Sometimes we've seen here in Ghana as well that they know exactly how they want to attack, and they know exactly what they want to attack, but they don't want the logs to be easily picked. So what they do, they usually flood the log files with 
loads of uh, sort of utter nonsense. Let's say fifteen thousand of logs of you know failed attempts to access a certain resource, but right in the middle of all of that is actually where the attack is. And if a normal, typical, let's say, uh, investigation is done, you cannot really go through 15,000 lines of logs and analyze them one by one to be able to pick up that one successful attack. Uh, usually there are tools for that, uh, which can actually pick it up, but uh, for a normal administrator, they scroll through the entire log and they will not be, you know, nine out of ten, they'll actually miss the actual attack. Now, the other things that they do is they delete the folders that they created through attacks. Uh, and the tools they use usually is, you know, command line, bash, bash scripting. Um, and in, in order to cover the tracks when, they, when a connection actually wants to happen, uh, what they do is they use uh, tunneling, uh, like proxy tools. So they hop around to different IP addresses uh, to get to the final destination. That's why you hear sometimes in the news that the countries, they want to make certain allegations. And then, you know, there's the famous uh, sort of... Uh, some administrators in states they'll come and say, oh, it was China, it was Russia, it was North Korea. But we don't know for sure. It could have been a proxy, it could have been a toy, it could have been a VPN connection. The last connection before they made the uh, attempt could have been in China, could have been in Russia. But this person could have been sitting in any other country for all we know. So this is what the, uh, sort of the hackers usually do. This is how they cover the tracks. So they hop through different, different connections. They just follow the traffic all the way and then it gets forwarded back again. So in case anyone does connection, anyone does investigation, they cannot uh, find to see where the original attack happened from. Now, going to a, a, a live demo, uh, which I've pre-recorded this. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you, uh, I think I have three examples for you. Uh, show you various different attacks. Uh, one which actually was uh, done in Ghana here. Um, we disclosed it uh, to uh, the bank and actually fix the issue, but they're happy for us to share this. So, so this is a demo of a web application, uh, uh, in this case, an internet banking. So the attacker is using a web application weakness to jump to different bank accounts. So in a typical scenario, you go to your online banking, you use a password, you may ask for an extra code, which they send it to you on a text. And then once you're logged in, you have your dashboard. Uh, which displays your balance, then you have authorization to do various different transactions. Uh, so what we did actually was that we logged into a one account, which is a valid account, and then from there on, we noticed that uh, the bank was using something called insecure direct object object referencing. So basically they were using some sort of a number on the uh, browser URL, and from there we can actually change that number, and since we had a valid session, i.e. we were logged in successfully, we could actually hop into a different bank account and have full access to that account and actually do other transactions. These, trans these accounts were actually both belong to us, so we didn't actually hack someone's account, but it, it, it did mean that we could actually start sitting there, guessing other people's account number, which wouldn't be too difficult, and potentially do damage to their accounts. So keep an eye on the, on the balance amount as we are showing this demo. So you can see this is a normal, typical, uh, I'm just trying to play the video. So this is an online banking scenario. Uh, I cannot replay it. Everything while I play it on a different language. I'm going to share my other window if I have. Right, so this is the, the demo. So this is a, a logged into um, an online banking, and we have got a balance of uh, some 3,000 CDs here. Uh, I'm gonna play that for you. So we interact with the uh, sort of the, uh, the, the online banking just fine. As you can see the list of transactions. Now take note that on the top bar, there is, where it's been highlighted, there is an account number that can easily be changed to uh, a different uh, account number. As long as you have the account number, you know exactly what it is. So that's exactly what we're going to go ahead and do. 
So we had another account number already uh, copied, so we just pasted that number there, press enter on the URL, as simple as that, not even using any tools as such. And as you can see, the opening balance on this account is 1,800 CDs, and then press enter. It loads someone else's account with a different balance of 570 CDs almost. Now we have full access to this account. Uh, we can do transaction search, we can set up transfers and all that kind of stuff. So this was done because the application was not uh, designed correctly and it allowed this uh, sort of direct referencing uh, of an object in the browser. Uh, this is how we could actually do it. So let me go back to my presentation. Right, so that was the demo, the first demo. So the second demo I'm gonna do is uh, bypassing two-factor authentication. So you may have had two-factor authentication. Some of you may actually use two-factor authentication. Uh, I, uh, either by a sort of third-party uh, services you use or internally at your organizations. So the idea is that as strong as your password may be, someone can still hack the password dump the database to get access to the backend somehow or they put a keylogger on your machine and they manage to get the password. So yes, you can have a password which is so many characters, but if the, if the person actually managed to hack the database which that password is stored in, they can get full access to it. So they, don't, they no longer need to actually crack the password. So what the industry did, they started adding a second layer of authentication. Uh, so by this, usually a text message is sent either to your phone or you use an app on your phone whereby a random number is generated which expires after a certain while. So after you put a username and password, then you put this code and this is how you log in. And that code expires in a certain time. So the idea is that this pa the password is something you know and the phone is something you have. Uh, and then later on, they've gone even further. After two-factor, they uh, make multi-factor, which they use biometrics, so your fingerprint as well. So it's something you are. So your fingerprint is unique to yourself. So something you know, something you have, and something you are. So this is going to showcase that, this attack is going to showcase that even though a two-factor authentication is enabled, it can still be somehow uh, bypassed uh, by doing a, a very clever attack whereby the nearer the website, in this case a, a Gmail uh, login page, and uh, the user gets prompted for the two-factor authentication, which is sent to the phone, and they still log in just fine. Uh, they think they're inside their own account, whereas the hacker actually now has full access to the account, and they can actually go in there and disable the two-factor authentication if they want to. So again, another brief demo for you guys, just to see. Let me go back to sharing my video. So there's a tool called Madishka. Uh, this tool is actually available free of charge on the internet, on GitLab actually, on GitHub uh, to download. So it's going to show a fake Google website uh, that looks exactly like Google and the user logs in from there and then it prompts them for a two-factor authentication token. So this domain here, of course, is a phishing uh, domain. So this, in a typical example, is be sent via email uh, with the usual urgent uh, sort of notice to say, oh, we have contacted you from the Google support team. Your account has been locked. Click, please click here to unlock your account. If you don't do this, we'll delete all your Google Drive and all your emails and you will not be able to get your account back. Something along those lines to make the uh, person not to think twice to actually verify the link and they catch them in some sort of urgent uh, sort of situation. So they click on it and they proceed further. So it looks like exactly like Google. You click on sign in. Uh, you put in your email. I'm sure you guys do this on a daily basis. Next page for your password. Now, if you have enabled on your uh, Google account a two-step verification, which is a free of charge service, it sends you a text message with six-digit verification to your phone. And this way, if someone actually does, you have your password, but they don't have your phone, they can actually access your account. In this case, they can't, because the person actually created a fake website, 
you as a user, you put your uh, sort of digit so you can see the the code came through on the right side on the top of the screen as a text. So you, you as a user, you put your code into this website. And then this one-time token is actually now hijacked. You get full access to your site, to your website. You can actually see your emails and everything. So it looks again, everything's operating just fine. As a user, you would not notice anything unless you're careful and you pay attention to the URL. So these are your emails. But then what happens here is that the hacker, they actually have a control panel on the back end. And this is their URL, this is their website. Now they manage to get your username and your password, and they can actually impersonate you. So now they have full access to your Gmail account. They have your password. They can change your password. They can disable the uh, two-factor authentication if they want to. So they can do a lot of different damages on your site, on your sort of Gmail. If you are one of those guys that has uh, all accounts linked to one email address, your Facebook, your social media, your work, your password, your covers, all that stuff, they can easily go through your uh, history of emails, pick up those information, now go and uh, attack your social media platform as well, change the password for their own Right, so that was Madlishka. Uh, let me just go to the next presentation. Uh, so this is again, um, this is just more or less something we discovered ourselves uh, here in Ghana uh, using that tool that I showed you earlier on, I showed them. So this is just showing that a risk of sharing information via misconfigured server uh, usually happens via negligence. Um, so, you know, we all have very different size IT teams and things happen, this happen at last minute, uh, especially with this whole pandemic, a lot of working from home. And we started sharing more and more data online because our management needs to be home and access the files, our users, our staff needed to be able to remote in to the, to the work and still work have to carry on. Uh, sometimes uh, security is overlooked and we expose uh, more information than necessary. So, um, so the information here I'm going to show you is something that we can easily access on the server um, by just scanning the internet, finding IP addresses, and a user can easily, a hacker can easily take information like this, use them for phishing attacks, use them for impersonating the person online. And you know now we can use that to launch better attacks. So basically, what it was, it was a, a public server, a public file server, which was accessible via the internet. Um, so we can uh, we had access to something over six gig of uh, data on the server. Um, so all, everything could be ran read in plain text without, without any restrictions. We didn't even have to put any passwords in to get in. And the issue with that is because the reason this happened is because. Uh, as you can see on the left screenshot, the SMB, which is basically a Samba protocol, is a file sharing protocol. They were using they were using version one, which has been uh, outdated for a long time now, and there was no authentication whatsoever enabled on it. So this way, they had this, all these folders on uh, the left side that you can see available easily uh, via the internet. So that's what we did. The middle the screenshot shows that we actually accessed these files. We could, true, we could freely roam around the files, and we could browse things like uh, someone's, uh, someone's NHIS cards, which of course we blurred it out to protect the identity. Uh, we could access uh, that file, that sort of uh, word document on the right you can see, is uh, some actual credentials for the ESET antivirus uh, tool they had. These are admin credentials that we could again also use that as a hacker to now log into the um, he said antivirus to have, potentially disable antivirus for all machines, and now start attacking these machines. So we didn't show the full IP address, but this IP address actually did reside here in Ghana, so it's a 19725 address, and it was running on a, on a Windows server. So that's it for the demos. Uh, so just a bunch of quick tips. I'm coming to the end of the presentation as well. So a bunch of quick tips for how to prevent such attacks, uh, what individuals can do and also health and care institutions can do to detect, minimize or fold such, such attacks is that first and foremost establish a security culture. 
you know, we emphasize it a lot on technology. We go get the best firewalls and antiviruses, all that kind of stuff. We forget our people. People are your first line of defense. Then in constant training, anyone from the front door receptionist all the way to top management, they need training, they need awareness, they need to exactly know how to use this technology in a secure way. It doesn't mean it has to be painful, it has to be something convenient for them, but this awareness needs to be created by having sessions like this, uh, get them to join public sessions, have internal sessions, have banners going up, and uh, like Sam was earlier saying, on, going around the office and just seeing what the culture is. Are these people using uh, uh, sticky notes, putting their passports on the screens and on the keyboards? If that's the case, then we should go around and actually tell them that this is not the best practice and use password managers uh, to sort of keep the password secure. Now, as an organization, also you need to be very realistic and be aware of your security uh, sort of risks internally and externally. So run quite regularly, once a year, once every six months, some sort of gap analysis, some sort of risk assessment, hire third party companies, utilize your resources internally to run the likes of Bonimate assessment, Pentas, and at least you can acknowledge what your issues are, and then based on your budget, based on your other restrictions, you can sit down and actually work and a plan to target the high-risk items. Uh, patch and update all devices and softwares, anything from our phones that you know, we emphasize a lot on bringing our own devices to work. Uh, our iPhones and Android phones, we bring it to work, we use WhatsApp, we download uh, sometimes confidential information on the same phone. When we go home, we give it to our kids, they download all sorts of games from online or our laptops, they use it to watch movies online or uh, play games. And, you know, they might infect that machine and someone actually may be able to see other files on the device that they're not supposed to. So again, endpoint protection on those devices, yes, but also update the operating system. You know, a lot of times we just ignore all these updates and all these updates actually include security updates and it's free of charge. So make sure you always, always update these devices. And the same goes for servers, devices within the enterprise network uh, have some sort of solution that goes around and picks up uh, machines which are not updated and does it automatically. Uh, goes without saying, firewall, whether a network firewall or application firewall, if you're hosting applications internally, it's definitely a must. Uh, there's no substitute for that. It's like what we said earlier on with the, with the house, you need to have the wall. You wouldn't leave your house open so anyone can just see inside your living room. So you need, definitely need to have the wall. Now, firewalls come in different flavors, and different prices, but you need to have one. You need to be able to maintain it well. And you need to make sure your doors and windows are locked and secure. So, i.e., your ports are all closed. Only you expose what is necessary to the outside in a very secure uh, manner. Endpoint protection, so the like of antiviruses, minimum basic. Yes, free is okay and it's good. But if you're in an enterprise environment, you ideally want to get a subscription to an antivirus or endpoint protection. The idea is that usually these ones, they have some sort of central platform whereby you can manage it, you can get prompts. Uh, and it can action immediately, even remotely. Whereas a free antivirus, every machine works on itself, and you have no idea, uh, you know, devices getting uh, infected unless they actually come and tell you. Control access to protected health information. I think this goes without saying. Like the demo I was, I was showing you early on, that we managed to access someone's uh, NHIS cards, uh, files, folders, and stuff like that. So if you are if you do have share, if you do have to share folders, application databases, again, make sure there's a proper authentication on them. Make sure the access is controlled, and is done in a very sort of a need-to-know kind of a basis. Lastly, uh, one thing you should definitely have, and this is something we see more and more here on the rise in Ghana, is to have a monitoring and response system in place. So the idea that's okay, fine, you know, it's a fast paced fast environment, a lot of changes are happening, applications are changing, we're constantly adding servers, but organizations fall behind from tracking to see what is uh, sort of services actually exposing themselves to. So once you have monitoring solutions, and uh, so you have these big monitors on the, on, the, on the wall, or it can be someone's machine, at least you get prompted that so-and-so is exposed, this is happening, someone tried to access the server, someone's trying to brute force the network, and then on top of that, uh, like the likes of solutions like Dark Trace here behind me, they also have an autonomous response. So if there was to be attacked, someone tried to uh, infect your machine with ransomware, they can also respond to it and actually present 
this side. So uh, last part of my presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about uh, briefly about uh, sort of navigating and building a career in cybersecurity. There's no right and wrong here. There's different different paths. You could be from different backgrounds in IT or outside IT. All it takes is to have an interest and what have that sort of uh, curiosity to sort of enter the field. Uh, so it's good to have a, a, a sort of a, a fairly good ground knowledge in IT fundamentals. Doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but as long as you know how networks works in IT, both external networks and internal networks, have a fair good understanding of how things interconnect. Have a fair idea of system, system administration, whether it's Linux or Windows or servers or PCs. Uh, database management also helps. Uh, more and more, we are putting more stuff on the applications, websites. Uh, Android, we're launching all these different, different fancy applications just to make it convenient for our users, our staff to uh, do their work remotely. So again, it's a good idea to have a fair idea of uh, web applications as well. Now, be also well versed in day-to-day -day operations, so physical security, you know, accessing uh, office uh, sort of uh, doors and CCTVs, and you see these sort of fingerprint entrances. Just to know that, okay, these are the potential vulnerabilities. These are the things people can do to actually physically attack a, a place. Is there a security person on the door? Do they verify to before they allow guests inside? Can anyone just roam around any parts of the building without being uh, challenged? Um, so this is also a good place to, if you could be from this background and enter the field as well. Uh, so soft skills, uh, this is also very important. I've seen a lot of guys in the field that have a very, very good IT knowledge, uh, you know, like nerds like myself, but they don't have the soft skills. They don't know how to communicate uh, technical information to a non-IT person. And this breaks down the communication and basically it creates, it creates a lot of delays in, your, in the work. So this is actually a very big skill to have. So for example, uh, the Example I showed you with the bank early on, I could go full technical and just say an IDOR exploit in the web application allowed me to inject uh, a malicious sort of code into the website and take over someone's account. Now, if you're not an IT person, that would not make much sense to you. So if I was to explain that to the management, I would just bring it down to layman terms and say there's an application vulnerability, which means that the website that you're hosting allows people to access places they're not supposed to. Simple as that. This is a very sort of simple layman term and anyone can understand that. So if you can explain to your 80 year old cousin and they understand it, that means your non-IT uh, people, sort of co colleagues and also understand. Uh, another good skill to have, of course, is to be able to work in teams, to be able to delegate, to be able to sort of uh, manage tasks and also to be able to work in, uh, on your own without any sort of management, anything around you. That's also a very good skill to build and have. Um, another thing also which is a big uh, sort of challenge here in Ghana as well is understanding the business procedures and processes. Sometimes you might have the best, most brilliant, appropriate idea to have to uh, safeguard a network, a system, a company. But if you don't understand the business procedures and processes and the red tapes that usually exist in organizations, uh, you get disappointed very early stages and you just give up. So it's very good to also understand these procedures and processes in place to know how to best approach. Who is the key stakeholder? Who's the right person to speak to? What should I show to them to entice them, to engage them in a conversation? Because usually they are busy with other stuff going on, other projects going on, and they don't have time to come and now and listen to you. So that's also very good to have sort of this understanding of the business procedures and processes. Uh, and in general, it's, it's a good skill to have to be able to uh, sort of solve complex puzzles, to apply analytical, analytical thinking. So don't take anything for face value. Also, always, always, always probe further. Uh, try to turn every stone and check to see if all the values are working. So, for example, in the case of um, uh, the discovery we made with accessing the files, find maybe our reconnaissance tools picked up some information and said, "Oh yes, this this server is exposed." But we didn't leave it there. We went all the way. We applied analytical thinking. We tried to solve the puzzle. We, we one tool failed. We tried a second tool. We actually tried to access the uh, sort of the files. Some certifications worth considering. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be certified. Even studying the certification itself is good. 
Uh, there are a lot of sort of again open source free uh, resources out there. You know, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and all that kind of stuff. Udemy, Cybrary at the bottom, and of course, there's a bunch of different paid certifications, which gives you good background knowledge, like CompTIA Security Plus, uh, Certified Ethical Hacking CEH. And if you want to get more specialized, you can do courses like the Third Item CISSP or a very re well-respected uh, course called OSCP, which is from the guys who created a, a very well-known operating system called Kali, Kali Linux, uh, Offensive Security, the guys behind it. And this course takes you at least six or six months to a year to actually um, get prepared for a pass. So this is something to be done much, much later in the stage. Uh, so the likes of Udemy and Cybrary, which you see the logo at the bottom, they are a part of something called Massive Open Online Courses. So there are sources that if you just search for that MOOC, you see a lot of courses. All you have to do is type the uh, topic that you're looking for. Most of these courses are actually free, and you can, it can be done in a week or two. Just to give again yourself that sort of background information, and it's not very technical. You can just learn various different things and have the sort of awareness around cybersecurity. Now, how to stay up to date uh, is very important. IT field, of course, and, and security changes a lot. There's always new ways of attacking. Uh, the uh, attack vectors change. Uh, new services are coming out, and so does the attacks. Like I showed you, Darktrace, which uses AI. They're now hackers, which are also using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Also, they need to speed up the attacks. They don't have time to scan the wall, to scan IPs, and sit down on one by one and start attacking. So they're also using tools, which has some elements of artificial intelligence built into it. So you have to keep yourself up to date all the time. It's good to sort of visit various different blog posts and news uh, posts to just to know what is the latest attack um, and what's happening basically in the world, just in case that your organization can also get attacked. Um, so I listed a bunch of different websites here. Um, so Krebs on Security is a very well-known journalist, and it has a very nice sort of enticing blog post and talks about real-world scenarios of attacks and how the hackers sometimes they get caught. And it does sort of you know cyber journalism, if you like, and it undercovers a lot of different uh, attacks. So for example, a few years ago when uh, the um, the U.S. Uh, sort of commerce company Target. Uh, was attacked whereby uh, hackers managed to get access to uh, a lot of credit card information. Krebs was the first one who reported on it. Reddit, if you have read about it, uh, Reddit is also a very good website for various different things. They have a, a, a section called NetSec that gets posted with different, different uh, uh, sort of information, whether it's training, whether it's job hunting, whether it's like a nice blog post. Uh, so it's also a good place to be and subscribe to. And the rest are just different, uh, various different news websites, uh, Hack Reader, Secu uh, Security Weekly. And if you are on Twitter, uh, Twitter is a very good place also to be in touch with various different um, sort of security professionals. And if you follow them, you actually learn a lot from them. Uh, podcasts also highly recommended. Uh, I do that a lot myself here, sitting in a, a traffic in Accra. Uh, sometimes I switch over from radio to a podcast and. Is a, is a very good way to learn about different different topics, uh, and there's a lot of cyber security uh, topics out there. I'm not sure if I have a bit of time. Maybe I can do some live demo uh, if you guys want. How, how am I doing with time? Abdul, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Yes, please. Um, you can go ahead with the live demo. I can go ahead. Okay, perfect. So I'll give you guys a chance also for questions too. Um, let me just switch my screen to my browser. So Elian, I mentioned to you uh, Shodan. Just bear with me. I believe you can see this. Right. Shodan is a Shodan is a sort of a search engine for the way Google is a search engine for information. Shodan is a Google for hackers, if you like, or sort of security enthusiasts. And they have uh, 
sort of free version of it if it's quite limited. Um, or you can have an account with them. You pay a subscription, which I have, and you can actually start searching various different things. So I'll show you an example. Uh, here I could actually explore and search, just type down the country Ghana. So basically I'm asking Soda to show me all sort of IP addresses that they picked in Ghana. Doesn't necessarily mean that IP addresses can actually be hacked. No, it just means that they had some sort of services which was visible online. It could be a website, uh, you know, a fairly innocent website. It's just serving information. It could be a server. It could be a machine. It could be a camera, CCTV, uh, all sort of stuff. Uh, so Shodan can actually pick this up easily. Now it also lists uh, various different cities. Uh, you can go to different uh, sort of uh, cities if you like. What I could also do is I can actually drill down to port numbers. So if you know a, a thing or two about IT and networks, you know exactly what these ports do and what they serve. Uh, maybe I'm interested in, let's say, RDP, a remote desktop connection. So I would ask you to show me anything to do with uh, remote desktop connection. Sometimes it actually manages to even take a screen. This is like a Windows server that we managed to uh, get the screen. This is someone's admin. So if I manage to get this far as a hacker, all it takes for me to sit down now and try to brute force the, the login page. And again, all of these are actually here in Ghana uh, and exposed to the internet. Again, we never know. The servers might actually be quite secure. They might have patched it to the latest uh, sort of uh, version of the operating system, the passwords might be quite strong, but in general, it's not a good practice to have uh, this port 3389, an RDP connection exposed to the internet. This is something that hackers can easily use and take their time to try to break into the website. Now, another place that is quite interesting for a hacker is a port called 445, which is basically a Samba protocol. This is the thing that allows you to do uh, sort of file sharing. So um, again, I have I drilled down to only SMB. And now I have 241 addresses, uh, sort of uh, different places that I can go to. Now from here, I know for sure SMB version one is something which is vulnerable uh, because Google, sorry, Microsoft announced announced this a while ago. Now I see another interesting here. Some of them they have authentication disabled. The rest have authentication enabled. Now, authentication disabled usually means that I'm not going to be challenged with any password whatsoever to be able to view the files. Quite similar to what I showed you early on with the um, with the files we managed to access. Now, again, I drill down further. I change my filter, so I'm telling it country Ghana. Any file sharing sort of service which is exposed to the internet, running on version one, which I know exactly what it does. And show me the ones which don't have any uh, authentication. Now it only shows around 50, and this very much is a, a, a outdated cache data. Not every single one of these work because they don't want to show you live data all the time. You could run tools, and you can scan the internet. You can actually go and search for these things yourself, and actually discover them. And there are ways of doing that as well. This is exactly what these guys do in the background, and they show them this sort of nice graphical way. Now, if I really wanted to verify this, uh, so I did my reconnaissance, I did my scanning. Now, if I want to really gain access, uh, let me just go to another tool I have here uh, and try to share that screen with you. So this is like a, a tool you ha I have on my Mac that I can just access um, a shared resource via the internet. So I know what the IP address is. I just copy that from the internet. I know what the port is. It's 445. I'm not going to put any username or password. I'm going to try my luck and see if I can actually connect to it. And yeah, guess what? I'm inside and I have access to a share folder on someone's server, which surprisingly enough got hacked already. And uh, someone actually put a, a, a decrypt uh, sort of uh, notes, uh, let me show you this so you can see. I might actually share my screen so you can see the whole thing. So someone actually left the decrypt notes uh, that they hacked this server a while back, back in 2020. And this is the instruction. I'm sure if you've ever been 
in, uh, so inflicted by ransomware, you see this kind of stuff all the time. So this guy's to show you that exposing your um, resources online, misconfiguring them, leaving uh, authentication disabled, not updating your server, this is what it leads to. It leads to you to be hacked. And this is actual live, live data that I'm showing to you here. Uh, as you can see. I mean, there's a bunch of other different uh, sort of uh, resources. Well, let me just try another one just for the sake of it. So, if I was to do this, I don't have any more. Also, please don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, you might get in trouble. I might get in trouble here. Uh, but I'm just doing it for the sake of demo. Um, Payment Connect, again, I have access to a folder called users. And also, they got hacked as well around December uh, 2020 with a different um, ransomware note. And very likely, all the files have been encrypted. We are not lucky enough to actually see some files because some other hackers got here before us. <laughs> but uh, that's basically gen the general idea. And the reason they got hacked is that because they have, if I was to click on this, I can see various different ports actually open on this device, which is more than, more than it should be. It's even running uh, the same IP address, some sort of a, a camera, a Hikvision Chinese camera. Uh, if we were to sit down and spend more time, or try to also break into this camera and see who they are and what they are. Uh, it's running some sort of web server on the same IP address with some bad SSL certificate. With a default um, Windows server page, so to me it shows that they never set up the web server. Uh, running a database. This app actually is doing a lot. Running MySQL. There's a remote desktop connection, which can, I can also use to attack that. There's another web uh, thing which they haven't configured. So to me, it looks like a, a server which was mid uh, testing and production and never got to uh, fully uh, sort of make it, but it is still on the internet. You know, it still is out on the internet. I can see its IP address, I can see its location. And um, if I was to spend a lot of time on this, I could start to damage it. Well, someone else already did, but I can find other examples here as a hacker and damage it. An ethical hacker, when they get to this stage, they won't cause the damage, they don't they exploit it, they, um, they actually report it to the um, organization, and uh, hopefully they, they hear you out, they get back to you, they'll fix it. We might even get something out of it, but usually we report it and then they, they, they fix the issue. So yeah, that's it from me. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I am available for uh, any questions that the attendees may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ash, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, would like to open the floor for anyone who has questions. Kindly raise your hand if you have any questions and Mr. Ash will answer. So uh, anyone who has any question, please kindly raise your hands and you'll be given the opportunity to speak. Um, seems Mr. Harry has uh, raised his hand. Mr. Harry, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, please, among the Linux distros, which one would you advise as the best for a cybersecurity person? Um, so, I mean, I used to use Kali myself, Kali Linux. Uh, then Parrot came along. Parrot is also quite friendly and useful. Uh, but these days, to be honest, I use a Mac and I don't even use any of these. I just install whatever tool I need directly to my Mac. But if you want something that has all the tools out of the box, either Kali or Parrot, uh, they do the trick. Okay, reason exactly I was asking this, um, I use Parrot sometimes, but I noticed it affects my laptop's fan. It makes it run very fast and it ends up crashing my hard disks. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're quite uh, resource intensive. I'm not sure if you're running on a, a virtual or if you're doing some sort of parallel uh, loading on your uh, device. 
but yeah, they do require a good amount of resources for it to run properly. Uh, so that could be the case with yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Abdul, I'll let you sort of. Yes, hello, um, Mr. Ash. Um, thank you once again for your wonderful presentation. Very informative. My name is Samuel Fosu. And um, for me, I'm interested in, uh, I mean, especially re regarding uh, EMR implementation, that's electronic medical records in implementations. Now, I know that a lot of the vendors of these uh, electronic medical records, I mean systems, in trying to reduce cost, some of them apply or their business model that they use is more of a SaaS model. I want to find out what the security implications are, especially with SaaS models, given that most of these things are on the cloud basis. And so um, they are they don't have these the various facilities don't have a remote set i mean a remotely built server in their facility whereby they have full control over the data so i want to understand what the security implications especially with SaaS models are uh it's a bit of a tricky one so software as a service uh i would go for someone who has a track record of building that solution uh, they've been in the game for a while. Even the cloud providers would just pop out and over. So I would go for the usual players like Amazon and Azure and Google and these guys. Um, that have a track record. They have a lot of these cloud providers for themselves. They have a lot of built uh, security to their platforms, which can be configured. Uh, I mean, cloud has its benefits, of course, because it's cost. But like you say, uh, you don't have too much visibility of the security. Could be hosted on a very secure platform. It's like a let's say a website. You could host a website on a very secure platform, but the website itself could have vulnerabilities. So again, the SaaS itself it may not be designed in such way that protects all the information. So if you come to a stage where you have to engage with a SaaS provider, I would ask for all the sort of questions. Where is your SaaS hosted? What kind of security measures have you put in place? Who has access to what database? Uh, you know, all these sort of questions, relevant questions, just to put yourself in a bit of a ease and peace of mind to ensure that the data you're uploading back and forth or your clients are accessing is not uh, unnecessarily. Even, for example, a Amazon, uh, famously, uh, they have this thing called the bucket leak. So Amazon has the, the S3 storage, uh, which is sort of this fast uh, and cloud-based storage for various different organizations. But if it's misconfigured, people can easily just go to a browser, type in different uh, a URL, and then different different sort of subfolders, and be able to access files directly without even being authenticated. Uh, so again, that's not down to the cloud provider as such. That's down to how the the bucket, the storage itself, was configured. So I would ask all those questions and uh, be sure that your SaaS provider is doing the due diligence and maybe even ask for some uh, compliances or if they have done any pen tests recently just to make sure that you know they've done the usual checks uh, before you kind of deal with them okay thank you very much any other questions Are there any other questions for Mr. Ash? If not, we would like to um, bring an end to the presentation. Are there any more questions? Please, you can raise your hand and be given a chance to speak. Um, I have a question for Sam, if he's still around. Mr. Sam. If you are online, please, Mr. Ash has a question for you. Yes, I'm online. Great. I'm Sam, online. I, noticed, yeah. I noticed you, as part of your demonstration, you had this uh, hoodie that you pulled yes. over your head. So I'd like to know yeah. where I can get that. Okay, so I'll send them to you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, okay, thanks. 
you, you know, and I use it a lot and in explaining the risk involved in not following uh, procedures because um, uh, most of the time, and uh, some members of management have this perception that, oh, we won't use the corporate emails because uh, somebody can read uh, corporate emails, okay, and we would also, uh, we prefer our Yahoo and, and Hotmail and the rest. And I get to tell them, listen, the issue is not about whether you're using a corporate email, it's about all your public email. The issue is about one, their corporate uh, procedures. So in the public sector, all public and civil servants are supposed to be uh, using the smart workplace, which is the government of Ghana platform managed by NETA, which is supposed to be secure for all public sector institutions. So that if you are like a DG or a higher ranking uh, manager and you are uh, using your personal and private email for sharing and sending very confidential uh, corporate uh, 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 documents and strategy, in the event that your Yahoo or Gmail account is breached, that's it for you because you've lost all your chain of uh, corporate information. But then if you're using a corporate email, chances are that you have a systems administrator or an email administrator who can probably reset your password and, and, and get you back onto your corporate uh, email accounts. And also debunk that notion that, oh, you are safe when you are using and Gmail and, 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 and Yahoo and Hotmail and the rest. The only way you can secure yourself is if you know and understand uh, what you are doing. The other thing I also use it for, sometimes when there is a breach, I want to let people know how it happened. Uh, there was one other site. If you, if you visited porn sites and X-rated sites and they are betting sites, it will tell you the, the, the source of your breach. And there was a director who apparently was visiting x ray site. Me, I didn't know. But um, he was always putting a lot of pressure on IT and condemning our corporate email. So uh, when I did a scan, and I do it routinely, I scan from DG all the way to director, to deputy director, to regional and director. And I prompt them that, listen, your email is compromised and, and check your, your password and re uh, use a stronger password. So when I bring it to their attention, some of them do conform and want to now look for uh, information or some awareness creation uh, and seminars. Uh, it also makes them read and uh, do some research. Uh, there are some also diehard who never change because they are the people who will tell you that they don't need, uh, they don't believe in viruses and Antiviruses are a gimmick from IT companies to deceive uh, people and make uh, money. So it's a low-hanging fruit that you can use as a means of communicating the risks involved in using the internet and also corporate uh, correspondence. And it does a lot of trick if you manage it well. I'm happy you spoke about soft skills when you're talking about the cybersecurity career pro progression path. Now, can you imagine if your DG or DDG or a very powerful person, you find out that his email is breached and you have to tell him that it's breached because he visited some porn sites and other sites, x sites, and those sites, you don't go there and come out clean and you have to break the news. <laughs> if you don't break it in a nice way, he will never like you forever because you might think that, oh, okay, so if my email is breached, it means you know everything that I've been doing and, you know, people's attitude become hostile uh, uh, towards you. So yes, it's, it's, it's one of the tools and that is required or you need to use or know if you're an IT professional in communicating uh, cyber security uh, issues to your to management. All right, so I'm done. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mr. Kwashi. Please, um, are there any other questions? Okay, um, Mr. Samuel, I can see your hand up. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, yeah, good day. Thanks for the presentation. And it's very insightful and uh, you've really opened my eyes about some new things that I 
initially didn't know about it. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mr. Pashito, as well, for your presentation. Uh, please, uh, about the authenticator, like the two-factor authenticator. There is this recent thing that I joined, uh, like I used to join, I'm a cybersecurity person as well, so I joined a group that we used to discuss things, new things on Mr. Samuel, Mr. Samuel, please, we, please can't, hear we can't hear you. What's, 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 Mr. Samuel, kindly fix your mic, please. We cannot hear you. Hello, please, can you hear me now? Yes, Mr. Samuel, we can hear you. Hello? Mr. Samuel. Hello? Mr. Samuel, we can hear you. Hello, please, can you hear me? Mr. Samuel, please, we can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So my, my question again, I'm saying there is this uh, new device, it's like, uh, yes, yeah, please, I'm listening to you. Okay, okay. Yeah, so my question is, there is this new uh, device that the hackers have developed, like uh, design a new de uh, device that can be used. Hello. Okay, please, I'm speaking. Uh, that can be used in cloning the... Uh, the norm, like we normally use this uh, two factor uh, two factor authenticator like text message and then phone calls to receive uh, codes so that we can use them to enter into uh, gmails facebook instagram and uh, some to twitter and all the social media accounts we use that to uh, have access to like to auto authenticate to make us like the rightful owners of the account but there is this device designed to to bridge that aspect and then have access to those codes and then to use that to use them uh, in the advantage of the hackers. So I don't know if there is any new development to solve that problem because it was just something that was just discussed two weeks ago. Thank you. Okay, sure. So if you're still talking about the two factor authentication, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so two factor. According to the new version of the payment card industry standard, the PCI DSS, the security standard from payment card, uh, card industry, they actually uh, they say that two-factor authentication is not so safe for sensitive information just because, uh, like you said, it can be bypassed and like a demo, it can be easily uh, sort of, uh, we can use tools to bypass it. So the new sort of way to protect yourself two-factor is to use multi-factor authentication. Now, the most of the multi-factor authentications, what they also do is that they use your location as well. So in the case of the Gmail that I showed to you, uh, and that's definitely the case, for example, with myself, my Gmail knows that I'm in Ghana. So if I was to ever try to travel outside Ghana and try to access my Gmail, I would not be able to log into it unless I finish my multi-factor authentication. So both I have to put my username, my password, then also I have to put my code, and then also I get a prompt on my phone that is this you, truly you, that you try to access your account. So this way you add an extra layer of security. So like we said, something you know, username, password, something you have, which is your token, your two-factor authentication, your phone to receive a text message, and something that you are, this is your biometric. So a lot of these, multi-factor authentications, what we've seen is that they send a push notification to an application on your phone. You do a, a, a sort of a thumbprint on your uh, built-in uh, fingerprint reader on your phone, 
and that allows you to get in. And this way, the chances of attack are very, very low. Uh, like I said, there are other elements that are timing involved. For example, some of these solutions also, they, they look at the times that you log into your account. Let's say every day you log in between anything between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. If someone tries to log into your Gmail 4 in the morning from a Russian IP address, it would actually flag it up. you are not allowed to come in. So the way to do it is to add one extra layer of security. But again, for daily usage, it might be overkill. You don't need it. This is only for sensitive resources. I hope that answers your question. Sam. Yes, please. Thank you. OK, um, please, if there are no further questions, I uh, would like to um, close uh, all their questions. There are no other questions I see. OK, so I'd um, like to thank everybody who um, tuned in for this webinar. I'd um, like to thank uh, Mr. Sam Kwashi and also Mr. Ash for finding time out of their busy schedule to uh, educate us on hacking. Um, I can say it has been very, 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 very insightful. And we've learned a lot about how to protect our data and also how to keep company data protected and intact from hackers and any other unwanted eyes. So if there are no questions, we'd like to close. And also we'd like to remind you of our upcoming webinar on the 11th of February, um, contains IT governance um, basically building resilient government governance structures in digital ecosystem and COVID-19 era for health care. So this will be done on the 11th of February. Please kindly tune in if you can. It will be very, very insightful. So thank you to everybody who will find time and goodbye. Hello. Thank you. Hello. OK, Hello. so we'll leave the floor to Mr. Sam Kwashi. Seems he has um, an announcement for us. OK, um, so all right. Please, the floor is yours. All right, OK, so uh, thank you very much for staying true to the end. The next webinar is on IT governance. Um, um, for those of us who have been in the IT industry for a couple of years or whatever period, you know IT governance is the bedrock, like the rock standard. Uh, the gold standard is, is, is the foundation of IT. Okay, so if you get your IT governance wrong, that's it. Nothing is going to go on well for you. So the next uh, uh, webinar is on IT governance. The speaker is Mr. C.K. Bruce, who is like the godfather of IT governance uh, in, the, in the country, and he's going to walk us through what IT governance is. Um, um, how IT governance must be implemented to build robust and resilient uh, systems in the healthcare uh, uh, ecosystem. And as well as also comment on the current structures and strategies that uh, can be employed uh, in, in, in uh, implementing or building an IT governance uh, institution. Uh, you will also be aware that the COVID-19 disrupted the way care is delivered. Yeah. Once upon a time, we were never interested in uh, smartphones and webinars and telecommuting and, and remote working. And now that is the norm. And you need to have some defined structures to manage the whole uh, spectrum of uh, remote worker and how the remote worker should access application and, and performance evaluation and, and strategic alignment and and value delivery and all those all those issues that pertains to the effective and efficient use of IT uh, resources. So we'll make it a point to attend. There's a lot you learn from Mr. C.K. Bruce. Uh, I must confess, almost most everything I know from IT governance, uh, not in theory, but in its implementation, uh, I learned it from him. And so you will benefit a lot. Thereafter, I'm seeking to also See if I can get in touch with the Auditor General to also provide some um, deep dive analysis into what you mean by uh, IT auditing and how the audit service intends to also undertake uh, IT auditing in a digitalized uh, ecosystem. Uh, we must also know that when you breach 
uh, legal and regulatory frameworks, including IT issues. You could be dragged before a court of competent uh, jurisdiction, and there are several uh, incidents currently taking place in the country. So make it a point to be attending these webinars. There's a lot uh, to learn from, and together we can drive the change that will require in the uh, healthcare ecosystem. So thank you very much. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sankwashi. I hope all of you will tune in and also um, get some knowledge, which will be very insightful to all. So thank you once again for everyone who tuned in. Um, we sure will get it. And we've come to the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.